So I, I will start and um, just, um, uh, actually I have, well, uh, just an explanation. I started to write this whole thing, but unfortunately I didn't finish it, so I'm not going to be tempted to read it. And then, uh, uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is that I, uh, just as we were coming in here, Jorgos made an ironic comment about scientific. And uh, it uh, I, I somehow it reminds me of a remark, a remark by Mies van der Rohe, which is that good criticism is, is it's a, a, in a little essay called Art and Criticism, in which he says, uh, good criticism is as, is as rare as good art. And um, so scientific or not scientific, I think that that's probably true. And uh, of course, that um, parallelism between art and criticism that Mies makes uh, also puts a question mark over anything that could be called scientific, you know, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis anything that might come under the rubric of criticism or art, that in neither case can one really think of them as being scientific. I know that Herman didn't uh, quite mean scientific either, that scientific already had quotation marks around it and was already used ironically by him um, but certainly, uh, you know, there is surely a difference between, I suppose, though not so great as one would think, uh, between uh, the way an architect looks at, uh, I mean, a practicing architect, I mean, one who's heavily into practice, that is, uh, versus uh, someone who is an architect but uh, somehow wandered off the track and uh, be become uh, a critic. and. Um, I, I think there is obviously a difference, but I, I, as I said, I think it's uh, one could exaggerate that difference a lot. And also, of course, it becomes uh, a mute point when, as, as is, I think, uh, uh, the case in certain countries more than others, both the critic, critic and architect are the same person, that, uh, that it is somehow normal for architect to also have, have a, a critical or theoretical life as well as a practical life. And, well, to some extent, of course, Herman has also had that kind of life, as everybody knows. But uh, this uh, role is more sort of readily accepted, I think, in some countries than others. And this in itself is a, is a statement about those cultures, I think. Although, of course, these things are, are always changing. Then the other uh, thing I wanted to say is that I, I started to write, I, and I began to say, and I began to write this thing, and then, uh, of course, other things intervened, so fortunately I did not finish writing it. And then uh, uh, yesterday afternoon and, and then uh, uh, last night I, and, and a bit this morning, I put together um, eight points, I mean, thereby avoiding the magical seven and nine, and the magical ten also, but uh, as you know, with points you can either spread them out or close them up, I suppose. And, and, and I think these pieces of paper are being these points are being distributed because I try to fulfill uh, something which I think I read in the program, maybe I, that one should sort of put out one's criteria. And these are not the best I can do at the moment for you know how one would define canon. I realized that, or maybe I didn't really realize that uh, canon had such um, religious, theological connotations, but I suppose one could have used instead the word seminal, but in any case, I think the idea of canon has be become, in any case, in English, rather sec secularized as a, as a term, so that uh, it doesn't really uh, quite imply sacred to the same extent as it maybe once did. Like everything else, it has become secularized. So before getting into these uh, ten buildings, I would like to just read, in this case, though you can read yourself, these nine points. Uh, the first reflection is uh, that in a traditional society, the idea of canon is almost self-evident and or so refined and specific that it takes a great deal of cultivation to discern the nature of inflection and change. Uh, Chinese calligraphy, I, I thought of as an example, that uh, what is the canon in the case of Chinese calligraphy? Uh, anyway, to an outsider, seems to be sort of relatively uh, clear. But the variation within that canon is sometimes very hard to, for outsiders to perceive, I think, maybe even for certain insiders to perceive.
conceive. And I think that obviously applies to maybe more readily in, in uh, maybe, maybe to every field, in fact, but uh, uh, it does apply to architecture, I think. And of course, it raises all this rather difficult questions about the way in which architecture is perceived by the general, by society at large, I mean, this whole problem of uh, ac accessibility. And then, of course, it, although I don't go on to say it here, of course, when, once the tradition is disrupted, well, the second point I do, you know, the disruption of the traditional society brought about by the ever-escalating onslaught of techno-scientific modernization and instrumentality has thrown the whole idea of talent into crisis. Uh, other than achieving maximum economic return for minimum, in, it should be investment rather than involvement, uh, homo economicus uh, uh, um, has hardly any other notion of what is a canon. This is all a bit screwed up, I can see. I should say that. Investment, mm -hmm. homo economicus, and has hardly any other notion. And then the third point, as far as architecture is concerned, I, I feel it's important to conceive of a canon as being engaged in the mediation of conflict between tradition and innovation through imagination. I, I have slowly come to feel this, this issue of tradition and innovation is a key uh, sort of challenge in a way that is late modern, postmodern, I don't know what, but anyway, I think it's something we are going to be stuck with more and more. And the fourth point, which uh, has affected the buildings I have chosen rather a lot, is this question of building and architecture, where building is attached to the idea of residential fabric, but it could also be, if you like, everyday fabric as well as residential fabric, workplace, for example. And, uh, and architecture, uh, this idea of civic institution, public uh, uh, dimension. And the fifth point, uh, involves this idea of the, of the canon uh, being determined by the idea of summation or crystallization. Uh, and that, um, that at the same time, while it introduces something new, new, a new paradigm here, I put, in relation to generic socio-cultural conditions, uh, it, it also has links to, to the past, you know, um, I mean, it cites here the, the conditions, changing conditions, for example, changing character of city, transformation of work, new conditions of building production, changing nature of civic institution and its relation to social and urban form. The point six has got to do with this business of uh, maybe the idea of Gestalt, actually. Uh, Herman mentioned this morning and again yesterday, this business of image, and it seems to me that uh, it's a very difficult thing to define image. I think that uh, one aspect of image which I'm interested in is this one that always incorporates or projects or facilitates some particular mode of living. The seventh point is got to do with retrospective prospective. Again, it's playing with this traditional innovation idea. And the notion that a canon uh, um, reaches back in time and reaches and uh, portends forward, or seems to portend forward in time. And the, la the last point is about this idea of masterwork or chef d'oeuvre, you know, that uh, this idea of, you know, a masterpiece, for example, the romantic notion of masterpiece, seems to me to be irrelevant to the idea of canon, that, uh, and that, you know, it's possible, as Herman said this morning, and I agree with that, that a building can be canonical without being totally successful. And then again, it has built into this is this notion of it, it carrying something within it that looks as though it could be, um, uh, you know, put, is open to development at some time in the future. I mean, of course, how does one, uh, uh, you know, just how does one recognize these qualities? I mean, I think in a way they can't be recognized except with, uh, in, in terms of the, of the overall sort of cultural inheritance in a sense, the, the total uh, legacy in a way, which is constantly being uh, deposited. I mean, every time someone does another work, I mean, this, this legacy is constantly being deposited. And also by virtue of being deposited, it's changed over time. I also, that also, of course, applies not only to the making of things, but also to, well, or making the things in the form of texts or interpretations. I like very much this uh, um, philosopher, English 
not philosopher, historian E.H. Carr in a little essay called What is History, where he, he writes against the idea of absolute history, that, that history has to be constantly re, uh, re, re, uh, recreated in a sense for each successive time. So then, then I will start with my 10 buildings. I mean, I, I think I, that's as much as I can do as far as uh, general criteria are concerned. And I will then try to, be, to give more specific criteria as I show the, each one of them. Uh, this is a building which uh, I, I think has been greatly neglected also by myself. Uh, it is a, built by, uh, in fact designed by a team working under a veteran, Eugenio Montiori. Uh, it is Rome Railroad Station, the terminus. And uh, it's mainly documented, but not only, in uh, Alberto Sartoris' uh, encyclopedias. Uh, and not the first one, but the one after the war, uh, um, dedicated to, to what he called Mediterranean uh, uh, climate building. And um, what, actually there are many things that intrigue me about this building because uh, it, it does reach back to the past in that it is obviously a building that, it, that comes out of Italian rationalism. Montiore was part, sort of part of the sort of end of Italian rationalism in a way, before the, the Second World War. And, uh, and it also is a building, I think, that, that moves towards the future. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have quite the right images to prove this point. But let, this long uh, office slab here, which is the kind of head uh, building of the railroad station, uh, in fact has two windows per floor. It is a sort of uh, scalar trick, in a way. And, and it induces an enormous sort of dynamism and horizontality to this block uh, that is the block that represents in a way the station qua station. Well, not entirely, of course, because this also represents station qua station. But I think the dynamism of this uh, wall, uh, I think in some ways reaches forward to uh, uh, work of Jean Nouvel and uh, Rem Koolhaas. I mean, this is uh, uh, somewhat... Uh, risky thing to say, I think, but uh, in as much as in their sort of recent urban building form, there is this idea of the monumental building that is sort of responsive to speed and, and is able to uh, make by implication a kind of urban uh, domain or, or space of influence. I mean, uh, it is both an image of the kind of dynamism of, of, the, of, the, of the urban, but also, uh, you know, emanates uh, a sort of a domain. I think that this building uh, uh, does that to a certain extent. And uh, there is a building which I, I should have, but I don't have, by also a rather unknown Italian architect called Gi Giuseppe Baccaro, who, who built astonishing post offices all over Italy, but also, uh, again, just before the war, a building for Ajib, a, a, a kind of uh, holiday building, which also has this kind of uh, very uh, strong horizontality and scalar game with, with horizontal. So that's one way I think it reaches uh, towards the uh, towards the kind of future that is still unfolding. Uh, this building is 46 to 51. And then the other thing is that if I remember correctly, and I'm not completely sure about this, that this station had already been partly in construction and is a kind of Novo Cento uh, 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 monument up to this point, and then has this kind of rationalist, reinterpreted rationalist uh, uh, head building put on it. And the other thing, which of course is very typical of all the publications we have, you know, and which also, and also uh, of uh, laziness of certain critics, uh, is that uh, what's uh, incredible about it is of course the urban space that I think is in front of it. The fact that it, it makes a relationship not only between it and history, the fact that also it touches history in an astonishing way by making it extremely dynamic in, in, in bringing it into the composition and making it very dynamic, so that although it's still archaic, it's, it's a Roman wall, of course, it, it is uh, brought into life by, by, by being placed into this composition. And then uh, there is this very interesting, I think, division of labor between uh, head building as galleria, because then it's a, a reinterpretation of 19th century building type, even going further back in part, uh, time. So that you have a gallery space running through here with all the sort of restaurants and amenities opening off this gallery space. 
on one side, of course, the other side opening to the, to the trains. And then the actual kind of ticket hall building, that, that, that part of the building which is the kind of primary sort of floor space in order to get on the train at all, is made into a monumental space that's separate from the idea of the Galleria space. So that I think there's again this interesting uh, sort of division of labor, typologically speaking. And this uh, uh, large canopy, which is really kind of enormous posh cachet, opens towards the city and opens towards the plaza, uh, you know, emphasizing this idea of the building uh, having this relationship to the public space. The, the, the thing that is missing, which I started to talk about, but forgot about, is the fact that what the plan doesn't show is the site plan, which should show the plaza, and then the, I think they are the bars of Constantine uh, that are, the, uh, that are uh, facing it. And, and therefore, of course, there is this relationship then, which a site plan would show between the, this building and the bars of Constantine. So, I, I mean, I think the building is really canonical because I think all of the so-called tendons are, in a way, could be, uh, you, you could say, it's already here, basically, the, the, uh, the neo-rationalism of the tendons. So it's already in this building. And the link between the first rationalists, uh, Tirani, and Jerry, et cetera, et cetera, and the second uh, neo-rationalists of the 60s seems to me to be, this is the, the building that makes this link. Next. I mean, uh, this uh, rather astonishing thing, which is this strange sculptural facade, which gives one the feeling of a relief, but in fact it's only an abstract figuration. I mean, you could say it's also sort of crypto-futurist, this I, uh, if you remember this triptych of, uh, of Boccioni, those that stay and those that go, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the figures of, of the railroad uh, station are, are, you know, carried in this relief. And of course, this relief is against, you know, a dress travertine within this kind of, uh, uh, again, reinterpreted classical tradition that links, of course, to the uh, Novecento. This, I think, gives one some idea of uh, the, the, the enormous kind of uh, heroic power of the object in relation to, the, to what is a very big public space also. Thanks. And then uh, the, the thing that uh, I, it's a hang up of course, but the thing that intrigues me is this business of the reassertion of structure as a symbolic representational element, you know. And so this dynamic kind of nervy like structure, although Nervy was not the engineer, uh, is the structure of the, uh, of the main porte uh, uh, entrance hall into the space. Next. And uh, this gives you some idea of what that volume is like uh, from Sartorius, of course. And here are all the other people that were involved. Uh, Massimo Castellazzi, Vasco Faticati, uh, uh, Annabel Vigilozzi, Tachili Pintonella. I assume, I don't know, young, young Italians working with Montuori. And, and this, of course, is the cross, uh, 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 the cross galleria. So the, the two kind of main volumes are this and then the, the gallery across space. <coughs> Next. I mean, as much as the railroad terminus is a city in miniature, I think this is a very clear statement of this idea of city in miniature. Next. And then I, I just show, because this has got to do with roots again, you know, and the way the uh, a cannon pulls at these roots, so to speak, or feeds off them, and then projects also forward, is of course this is this is these two buildings are 20 years apart. This is Pierre Luigi Nervi, early you know sort of coming out so to speak with Florence Stadium, and this is Pierre uh, Luigi Nervi plan of the ceiling in the Gatti Woolworks uh, Woolworks in, in uh, outside Rome, and uh, of course I think, uh, what I'm getting at here is the, the structural uh, this Italian um, isostatic uh, structural culture in a sense in, in concrete. Next. And then uh, in uh, 42, I think, uh, Montuori makes this competition entry for a, I believe it's a railroad station in Sofia. Uh, never built, but what uh, I think, you know, th this is just, you know, well, the war is on already, but it's, it's the sort of the, the, that moment in the Italian rationalist. Uh, or the conflict between, uh, let us say, Piacentini on one side and uh, the Tirani MIAR group on the other, 
uh, you know, comes in, in works like this to some point of, of very, you could say, almost resolution or convergence of some kind. The, the notion of a rational monumentality and, and, uh, and the generosity uh, or the power, I mean, the, the monumentality, I think, but also it's a monumentality that I think uh, part, uh, uh, depends upon a very strong civic sense and also uh, depends upon generosity is very present, I think, in this work, uh, in, con in conjunction with uh, uh, a certain kind of engineering, uh, again, structural expression over the roof. Next. And, well, just a comparison between uh, 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 Tirani's project for the Danteum, 38, and this project by Montuori for the central competition, for central piazza, in the um, EUR 42 exhibition site. Um, well, you know, uh, you could, this kind of uh, rationalized plan, and of course, I mean, the, the coursework of the stone on the main block of the Rome Railway terminus, I have in mind here, the relationship to history, this kind of uh, relief. Uh, next. And then, you know, reaching forward to 76, to this uh, project by uh, uh, Giorgio Grassi, for the student dormitory in Chieti, you know, as, as, as a, you know, I'm trying to push the point, of course, of this business of roots going backwards and uh, 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 culture thrown forwards by the, by the work. This, this creation of, a, a, you know, turning a city in miniature, turning actually a student dormitory into a city in miniature, in effect, for this attempt to do so, that is. Next. And of course, uh, just well, just to refer to both of them, Aldo Rossi's uh, Galera Tesi, uh, where housing this this arcade, this excessive monumental arcade running under the house, also has, I think, ultimately similar intention, whether one thinks it's appropriate or not. I, I personally think it is not appropriate, but I'm trying to show the again this projection forward into the neo-rationalist moment. Next. All right, so that's the, the first one, which is uh, uh, this uh, 46 to 51. And now this is uh, 1960, big jump really, but uh, uh, this chronology is a bit screwed up. But anyway, the second building I chose was, was the Atelier 5, Seedlow of Harlem. And uh, I chose it because, I mean, working off this business of civic institution residential fabric, that it, it, uh, is, it still seems to me to be in, in the, in the post-Second uh, World War history the canonical piece of low-rise, high-density housing. And uh, the idea of ex, well, suburban or ex-urban low-rise, high-density housing, uh, admittedly planned as a kind of sidlum, as, as a settlement, um, within this forest and very, very close to Bern, but isolated. I mean, the idea of, uh, of commuting from, uh, you know, it, within the Bern region or into Bern from this uh, settlement that is, a, is, that is a kind of uh, fragment that is disposed uh, uh, in, in the uh, ex-urban area. And related to this landscape, of course, to this uh, concrete bridge, uh, and with its own little uh, certain kind of communal facilities like this swimming pool which, at this high level here uh, on, on a terrace si a site uh, cross wall megaron type of house uh, facing uh, uh, south next and um, this shows the the way it's cut into the ground this uh, very interesting little uh, element, which is a sort of footpath, which leads down this enormous slope to the road. Uh, here is underneath this part of it is uh, because it is very much. Uh, this is a point at which this issue of the automobile comes in, as opposed to uh, the railroad infrastructure, because uh, it, there's a uh, cars park in this huge tank underneath in this one position here. And, and then people walk from this point into this uh, little tiny square with a grocery store and a club room and a, a central heating stack, which gives a kind of vertical element. And then into various types of row houses that are, all have a small little rear garden and the body of the house and then a, a, a 
rather a smaller <coughs> front garden or court than the body of the house and then the rear garden. And a high level uh, swimming pool with, with, step, with stairs up to this, this high level. Next. And uh, this, uh, this connection which intrigues me down to this road and, and, and up to the, uh, I mean a very interesting topographical, sort of informal topographical link. Next. Next. And, uh, well, it's the same thing of course, just another version showing the, the boundary, the way the whole thing sits within a very uh, uh, clearly defined boundary, which I think also is, is one of its uh, virtues. Uh, actually, I, I, I don't have a single uh, building by Le Corbusier in this tent, but this, uh, 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 you could say it's almost perverse, I think it is perverse, but this uh, 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 is in a way in lieu of, because I think this of course clearly is influenced by, and what what interests me about uh, this gets back to this business of masterpiece and all the rest of it, and master in quotation marks. I think it's quite easy for, not so easy, but it's quite likely that a work that is canonical could be done by somebody who's not up there, you know, in, in, but at a particular moment, under particular conditions, is able to achieve something that uh, is, is uh, in my opinion, canonical, and in that it still opens to the future, to, to future development in the generic sense. Next. And, uh, well, it's, this light is pretty awful, as uh, Herman said this morning, but this is actually, believe it or not, a, a good image of the, cl of the club room as it was uh, in, the, in the sort of mid-60s, actually. It uh, opening off that square. I think it's a, a, an element, by the way, that has fared less well than the grocery store. There were two elements here, a club room bar and a grocery store. You know, this whole uh, question of, of um, trying to make a kind of surrogate um, public space, village centre for this seed loan. Seed loan, by the way, that um, private speculation uh, almost entirely, uh, um, um, you know, occupied by professional middle class, really. But, uh, speculation even uh, uh, made by professional middle class and, and of course, subsequently occupied by professional middle class. Thanks. And, uh, well, some shots of the interior. Uh, this is the living dining room of the, of the narrow type where the stair runs across the unit. Entering here, kitchen, dining, living, down to garden. And then, uh, uh, well, it depends. You can have uh, a bedroom and kind of uh, cellar at the back, or bedroom and master bedroom at the back around this cross stair shaft where the whole thing drops one floor and this very ingenious device which enables this part of the garden to have co complete privacy from the uh, lateral view of the adjacent uh, terrace houses. Next. And uh, well, kitchen and that cross uh, staircase. Kitchen looking now towards the uh, uh, small front yard by which you enter. Next. Next. And, uh, well, all these sh shots are very hard to see because of the light, but, but um, this is the sort of uh, living room balcony looking out over the garden. All this is looking from the, what is happening to it? From the living uh, um, across into the garden. Next. Next. And, the, and, the, and this kind of absolutely straight called staircase, this split uh, tread staircase running down uh, uh, from the living level uh, down into the garden, this being the workroom. Or the, these lower levels can be used in different ways, an option to being used as workroom or as children's uh, bedrooms and so on. Uh, next. And uh, well, upper bedroom, again, this is this, of course, Unité Marseille dividing wall that is, uh, that is here between two children's bedrooms. And, uh, and this looking down, of course, onto grass-covered roofs. Uh, this, all this syntax, of course, coming from the master himself, so to speak. Next. I mean, Maison Jaune is here, you know. Uh, 
uh, I think finished in 56. And, uh, and of course I'm comparing grass covered roofs. And also this I think very subtle game of stone covered concrete roofs, grass covered concrete roofs. This being this, uh, you know, eclipsing of creating an area of visual privacy beyond this uh, 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 extended flat uh, canopy over the, over the garden. Next. And then finally, of course, uh, 49 Rock and Rob of Le Corbusier, which is the, which is the model for, of course, for uh, uh, Harlem of 60. So reaching back to that model. You know. Next. And uh, reaching back to that model and, and, and being a kind of critique of the, this kind of uh, Hilbersheimer, Stempel, uh, low-rise, high-density housing, carpet housing, L-shaped courtyard carpet housing. And having an influence on this, which is the, uh, a book published by uh, Shemayev and Alexander in 63, three years later. Uh, where low rise identity is, is, is you know, dense uh, low rise identity is, is, predict is, is proposed as a revisionist suburban settlement model for the United States, um, with not, of course, on a sloping side, uh, on a sort of generic flat side within gridded conditions. Sorry, and can, can we? try to put cardboard in that thing, because it's so, such a pity that we can't see your slides. It's uh, a technical thing, but can uh, somebody help me uh, uh, to do that? Uh, right. Yeah, let's make it five Link to Zhao, yes. And then, um, well, of course, uh, let me just, one uh, thing, of course, I'm, I'm not playing straight really, because um, actually there was some argument about this 10, and I am, of course, uh, as you can see, squeezing other elements in. But uh, uh, I, I'm doing so to sort of um, Substantiate this idea of the of the canon reaching backwards and forwards, um, and this uh, this 60 just to finish with this business of 63. I mean, it it, it well, it's out of print. This book and it's 25 over 25 years, right? Almost, you know, almost. We'll soon will be 30 years, and um, relatively. I mean, the sad thing I think, which you can say, well, so much for that, but. 
is that um, but the sad thing is that this reformist uh, attitude towards land settlement, I'm, I'm, of course these remarks are particularly um, referential to the United States, but I think that given automobile culture, uh, uh, the same dilemma is, is everywhere, is that, uh, um, uh, you know, this uh, model of low rights identity in general, which I'm, I'm arguing that, that uh, Siedlung Harlan is a particular demonstration of it, but not the only way, of course, it could be made. And there was another example I could have taken, which is Roland Reiner's Pukenau in, in, uh, uh, on the Danube. And of course, there are many others, but, but, well, a few others. I mean, maybe, you know, there are 10 good ones you could sort of point to, really. Uh, really, really exceptional ones. But, but the, uh, I mean, the sad thing is that it hasn't become a, a general cultural hasn't become for, for, for lots of complicated reasons, I think. Uh, it has not been, uh, it has not become a, a sort of a normative pattern of, of land settlement, really. With, with, of course, in my opinion, disastrous consequences that just go on and on and on, and, and ecologically disastrous consequences also. Mainly, mainly ecologically disastrous consequences. Next. And then this odd thing, I mean, uh, I did find making, and I suppose everybody had this problem, choosing these ten uh, was, a, was a difficult uh, business. And I, I, I sort of, I sort of cut, some of the choices I made, sort of I surprised myself, really. And, and uh, because this one is an odd choice, which is the uh, Hans and Fertel apartment building of uh, Alto, um, of the... Uh, has a fertile uh, building exhibition, 57. And, uh, and this, this, is, you know, this is this rather chaotic site plan uh, with certain amount of uh, slab blocks and this item, which is a kind of critique in a way of the slab block, which has this odd form. And I suppose uh, that odd form alone would not be reason to think about it too much. Next. Um, but what, what I think uh, intrigues me is, again, it's a typological issue, which is that this, of course, is the uh, Viridia's section of Le Corbusier of 1934, based upon Russian paradigms, basically. And, and with the interior street and the lockover units, uh, uh, mega, Megaron type again, you could say, like the Megaron type used in Rock and Rob, but, but with different different origin. I mean, the, the, the Megaron type in Rock and Roll is more directly influenced by vernacular. And then the, the odd thing about this is that since you come into the living, in one case, living, dining, kitchen, and go up to bedrooms above, and in the other case, come into a gallery of kitchen, dining, go down into living, sleeping, and to bedrooms behind, you have very different criteria applying to the units that go up versus the units that go down. And despite the fact that it makes this un unbelievably remarkable thing, 52 unit in Abitacio, which is undeniably, uh, could be co said to be canonical, I think that, that uh, typologically speaking, the units of which the unit in Abitacio is composed do not open to development. This is my argument about development. Next, uh, whereas the, the units of the Hansa Verbal do open to development, it seems to me, and this is the, you know, the problem, I mean, it seems to me that the residential issue has two sides to it, in a way. One is this low-rise suburban, ex-urban residential development, and the other is high-rise. Now, I, I'm not trying to say that the only uh, fertile uh, development after 1945 in the area of residential is uh, this building. I mean, one could say uh, uh, there is a, a most, for a much higher class, there is a most remarkable typology developed by Kadirk in Barcelona. I think remarkable also urbanistically, in, in the sense of inner urban uh, typology. But um, what I think is astonishing about this is the attempt to take atrium type, which is the, the same type that uh, you see in the Hilbersheimer mechanical grid layout, and, and bend the or manipulate the atrium so that it becomes an apartment. And the, these apartments then being 
you know, with their own little, not just a little balcony stuck on, but a kind of quite a deep terrace, the dimensions of this being key, and the dimensions of this in relation to the living room being key, and also the orientation as well. I mean, I can talk about other things like the metaphor uh, in these uh, Leica, uh, Leica, precast Leica panels uh, 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 applied on the, uh, on the outside of the uh, concrete frame. The, the way the coursing is handled, of course, on, these, uh, on this thing uh, is, is, of course, a metaphoric reference to stone coursing, although it is, uh, it is metaphoric. It, it, it doesn't deceive you that it is stone coursing. But there is a kind of a somewhat classical uh, evocation through this, I think, reference to coursing. Next. And then it has this uh, uh, somewhat odd, but also, I think, again, not, particularly, not fully successful, but there is some attempt here to make some kind of uh, 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 more adequate entrance into the, into the dwelling unit, collective entrance. In other words, it, it's an sort of attempt, again, vis-a-vis -vis classic, to reinterpret peristyle uh, and, and even Palladian sort of peristyle space underneath or within. Next. Uh, with this, all this metaphor of sky and so on, and, and, and uh, uh, bound columns, uh, which relates, of course, back to Finnish vernacular, but here, you know, uh, peculiar hybrid of, of part classical reference, part uh, uh, straight engineering reference, of course, to Corbusier's kind of columns as we have here, concrete, the standard Hennepy concrete column, if you like. And then, also, uh, uh, but also peristyle, next. And this, uh, which I think is also an achievement, which this being the growth at that level, this being the peristyle, that the proportions of this space, for example, which is the common space distributing to these uh, atria apartments, it first, first of all is a remarkable proportion in relation to elevated stair. And secondly, is uh, they are always open to uh, uh, light and outside air, which is something that usually one does not uh, have provided. And next, next, and uh, and then the unit itself, which has, I think, this in intriguing business of well, this is the kitchen, which actually flows into this dining space, which participates both with the living space and with the outside terrace. And this being, then you walk in this direction to these bedrooms shown yellow, this being service space, bathrooms and uh, storage and kitchen, uh, here being coded in red as service, blue being co uh, coded as a kind of public within the private unit, and green as semi-public and, and, and yellow as private, I mean, it's a, it's a type that could be developed uh, in the future. It seems to me still a very valid type. Uh, next. Well, then the set, more or less the same day is Mises Seagram. Well, I think the very first sketches for Seagram were uh, uh, 54. And, uh, and it is worked out, I think, 57 to 59. It's actually under construction when Arthur Drexler holds an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art called Buildings for Business and Government. And uh, this is sure is a building for business for Seagram. Uh, ironically called by some people the Brown Booze Building because uh, <laughs> of the anod uh, anodized uh, steel and the brown glass, you see, that all fuses as though it is one thing. And, uh, uh, and in fact, Mises' model for this, which would be nice to have, but I don't have it, slide off, that is, is entirely a metal shaft where there is no discrimination between the metal shown in the model and the, met and, and the glass. The glass is looked at as though it is metal. And, uh, well, there are, again, there are things that uh, I don't feel I can adequately explain with the material I have, I'm ashamed to say, which is this relationship to the Rackets Club opposite, which is with this kind of Beaux-Arts building, which is absolutely on axis, and this creation of an urban space on this Park Avenue, of course, for some people, uh, it was seen as a violation of the idea of Park Avenue as a street, uh, bubbled by Vincent Scully, of course. But uh, uh, this raised uh, sort of podium plaza space, which is actually, in fact, uh, used uh, to an incredible extent in, in the summer, uh, 
Um, I mean, one of its virtues is, I think, this this urban this creation of this urban space, uh, a recent creation of urban space. I mean, there is, of course, in Manhattan this astonishing Rockefeller Center, which is perhaps one of the most remarkable, I think, urban pieces made in the 20th century at all. But since this time, the time of Rockefeller Center, I think there is very few examples of convincing urban space in Manhattan. I mean, Lincoln Center, I suppose, is sort of making an effort, but it does not have the authority of this much more modest, but uh, I think strong uh, urban space. And then the building itself, which is also hard to convey, has enormous authority as a building. Uh, maybe the use of the word authority, of course, is already an indictment of this building. Um, what I mean is that, uh, at least for me, uh, wandering around Manhattan with one uh, appalling commercial high-rise after another, one worse than the next, actually, built since this time, I would say. I really doubt whether there is a, a high-rise building in Manhattan that is at all equal to this building since it was built in 59. I think all of them, since that time, in 30 years of production, are inferior. And some, of course, it's grotesque to make the comparison. Uh, and uh, it is interesting, I think, that, the, that despite the fact that the whole postmodern argument about the fact that you know, we can't have any more flat-top buildings and these buildings are unfinished, what I think is remarkable about the Seagram is the way the building does have a kind of top and does indeed, of course, have a bottom. Um, the, the, other, I mean, the other thing about Mies, which is, uh, which is difficult to talk about, is this... Uh, this notion, which I think uh, makes him a person apart in a way, in, in, in these ten buildings anyway, that I have selected, uh, that uh, the, the, the consequence of modernization is silence, really, because the extreme secularization and the extreme, uh, the, the reality of the extreme secularization and the extreme modernization and of the abstracted, uprooted condition of, of everybody in the, modern, in the 20th century is such that one can only fall silent. This, this is, I think, uh, one can only, as it were, make the thing and fall silent. I mean, uh, you know, that, that, I mean, there is this very difficult to talk about project that the spiritual uh, stature of the work is supposed to transcend the disinherited condition of the modern, but that the disinherited condition of the modern has to be faced for what it is. I mean, this, I think, is, uh, 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 you know, if, if you don't sort of begin to get that idea about Mies van der Rohe, you don't understand it, in my opinion. Uh, that, and, and also, of course, you have to, I mean, what supports this argument is that German thought, ger German intellectual reaction to the uh, state of the modern is probably more, I mean, in my opinion, the, uh, Germans felt the apocalypse of modernity more than anybody else, I think. I mean, German intellectuals. And, and quicker, uh, sooner than anybody else, and more intensely, I think. Uh, why, I don't know, it's uh, great, not so easy to explain. Yeah. Next. <coughs> and uh, I, I hesitated in, in, in uh, choosing this building. I, I, I had a problem about whether to choose this or 860 Lakeshore Drive. Because there is a, there's something in 860 Lakeshore Drive which, which is closer to what... Uh, but I still don't have the image, I'm sorry to say, which shows it. It's closer to what would explain more what, uh, the point I just uh, tried to make. Um, you see, this, this, this bustle at the back is filled actually with this dark uh, 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 granite uh, within this anodized frame. Which are, and here, of course, the, 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 the office buildings are glazed. And uh, in a sense, one's eye, one's eye is deceived. And yet, of course, the statement is made that, that, that you know, this is, I mean, it's clear that this is not... I mean, this isn't kind of glass that is obscure. You know, you could have treated this in obscure glass also and put something behind it and no one would know the difference. You know, and as many commercial uh, architects probably... Next. There we go. 
And then uh, this business of, you know, the given technology is the steel frame. It is fireproofed in concrete. And then it is, lost it, uh, 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 you know, represented, so to speak, it, with this skin that represents the, the uh, frame. And uh, this one's gone altogether. Uh, this, is, this is 860 and just shows the less obvious variation between the, the, the detailing of the same problem. More direct, of course, at 860. Next. Uh, More, more direct in 860, and and the, you know the the, the IIT campus 52 to 56. I mean, this attempt to make the uh, never built this. This is the elements of the uh, uh, administration building, where where the steel is not fireproofed, and and uh, there is this Baukunst building art being the the only statement to be made in the, in the situation of silence, in a sense. Next. And then in, in 860, the fact that this, well, the, the image I have missing is the hauling up of these frames as prefabricated elements into position, you know, that are the kind of production reality, hard production, economic production reality, very economic buildings, in fact, built for a developer and then the facing of the, of the fireproof steel in, and then the fact that the, the logic of the frame module and the fattened structural module gives you this syncopation in the, in the facade with too narrow, too big. Next. So, brings me to, not to 68 quite, but almost, certainly to my midpoint. This is, this is the building that was worked over a long time, Sydney Opera House. Uh, 57 to 73, and finished in 73 without Woodson, of course. Uh, after 16 years, Woodson left, and uh, it was finished by an Australian architect called Peter Paul. And uh, these are early sketches by Woodson for, for the competition. <coughs> An image I should have here, but I, I don't, is a very a remarkable drawing of Woodson which shows a Chinese roof floating over a podium, raised podium, which unfortunately I don't have it. But because I think this business of, of uh, pat, you know, type paradigm, uh, a new kind of paradigm, is this notion of uh, com making a building, a public building, consisting of a podium on the one hand with a floating pagoda, pagoda pole over the podium. Podium Pagoda is, I think, the uh, interesting, interesting contribution of Woodson. And the other interesting contribution of Woodson, uh, I think, of all the ones I've shown up to now, is that the one, it is the figure that goes out of his way to escape Eurocentric uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, focus and, uh, and deliberately travels all over the place to the Far East and to North Africa and to Tibet and to China and to Japan and to uh, Mexico and, uh, and an absolute deliberate kind of grand tour that is not the kind of much uh, different grand tour from the grand tour of 18th century or even now and, and pulls out of this a, a, a uh, as I see it, transcultural synthesis. On the one hand, podium taken from uh, pre-Columbian culture, uh, all these kind of plateaus of uh, raised podium pyramids of pre-Columbian culture, and pagoda of, of uh, uh, Chinese oriental origin. Next. <coughs> and in Sydney produces this uh, thing, which, I mean, uh, the, uh, here, I suppose I'm getting dangerously close to quote unquote in big question marks, masterwork, but uh, this very long point of the solution being to make an Acropolis Agora podium that opens on a monumental scale to the city, and then these flying pagoda fly out towards the water, and of course towards the, the Sydney Harbour, 
And, and having, of course, to compete, compete with the form of this enormous bowstring uh, arch of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which I think it does very successfully, both formally and, and uh, well, mainly formally, because it's bone nowhere near the size of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Next. And, uh, well, this is, it. this is the agony of building it, of course. And one of the interesting things is, and of course the nightmare of building it, uh, and here one comes to this interesting issue about reason and, and symbolic intent, because uh, Arab, uh, Ove Arab being engineer, also Dane, of course, but working in England, Peter Rice, uh, as it were, cut his teeth, so to speak, on this building. Uh, 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 the, I mean, the, pr the, the problem was, 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 you know, how to build these bloody shells. Well, first of all, what are they exactly? Because the, the early, early drawing was not what was built. And, and Woodson could not figure out how to make these shells. And this brings up an interesting issue because, you see, well, it's true of all architects, I think, but, you know, what is interesting about Se what Seagram and, and Mies and Woodson have in common, one thing, which is this interest in rationalized production, that Uts Woodson despite the fact that it doesn't look like that, is very interested in rationalized production. And, and one of the important things for him was to, to make these shells in such a way as one could make them uh, out of a repeatable number of units, minimum repeatable number of units that could occupy different, that could take different curves. And uh, he finally sort of got, got hold of this whole thing by cutting a sphere up and making the shells into parts of the, of the surface of the sphere in order to get this uh, pattern of repeated units. And it, it was a, a long time before that was achieved. But this did not solve one of the worst problems. One is, of course, the, the stability of the shells in this direction, the fact that each of the shells stand, as it were, on two feet. And also the enormous uh, pressure, the compressive force, brought to bear at this point of this huge shell coming down to this single point. These, these two, uh, apart from the fact of, of lifting these enormous pieces of precast concrete into the air, uh, and so on and so forth. The, these things were the nightmare for Arab to, to build this thing. And Arab, Arab sense somewhere or other, you know, we, we talked at one time of making this thing out of uh, uh, steel construction and putting a uh, 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 lightweight uh, covering on to make the shells in this way. But uh, uh, this would have been more rational from the point of view of economy and, and uh, you know, the whole business of lifting this amount of weight. But also given this is the moment of his, you know, uh, what our technology could do at the time. This certainly, this is not high tech. But it's not, uh, I mean, you know, on the one hand it's not high tech, on the other hand it, it, it is concerned with rational production, even if from the point of view of, of technological economy, it is not rational. I mean, this is two different uh, uh, criteria, for example, that one can talk about. And uh, what is interesting is that this uh, uh, whole, uh, all these shells next are covered in Hoganas, uh, uh, Swedish tiles. And he realized that th th this shows the, I seem to have this other sequence, this shows the, the, sh the system, the kind of form that the shells were soon after the competition. You can see that they have no form at all, really, basically. And it shows, I think, more clip. Also, the, the, the idea of podium, of course, is clearly shown here. And also, uh, this uh, automobile bus drop off underneath this uh, uh, pedestrian podium. One of the things which I think is touched on here, I will come back to this business of these shells, is uh, you know the problem of the automobile. I think that if one looks at 20th century architecture, one sees this constant struggle to deal with the automobile. I mean, you mentioned. And I think actually Nouvelle is very uh, brilliant at this in a way, in handling uh, parking, you know, and actually leaving it open if possible, underneath the building, you know, and, and giving it a tectonic shape, you know, this, this thing that you showed. I mean, I, I didn't know it was like that, I've never seen it. And, and uh, you can see already here this kind of uh, problem of the, of the contradiction of the idea of an agora podium and the fact that quite a lot of stuff is going to come in underneath the building, you know, this. Uh, Next. Or, for example, I mean, you could compare this to Siedlung Harlan, where the cars are put in this tank underneath, and you walk, you know, this kind of schizophrenia between this automobile and being a pedestrian, you know, which is, which is I think, right throughout the, since, since the mass ownership of the automobile is, 
is it hangs over the whole business of doing architecture like a like a nemesis. And and uh, well, this shows that undercroft plan, which by the way has a nervy. I don't show it, but has a kind of nervy like structure to it underneath here. And it shows the podium and the twin auditoria and so on. And the fact that this rather ingenious game of coming behind these auditoria and, and, and so on. Well, you know, from the point of view of, of doing grand opera, this building is not a success. And they abandon the idea of doing grand opera in this building. There are certain operas they do do in this building, but grand opera of the biggest kind, they do not. And, and of course, even doing modest opera is, is always this problem of using vertical lifts in order to get the stuff up and down because of this problem of you know, the, the, the narrowness of the site. And the other dumb solutions of the two, the auditorium facing away from each other would of course solve that problem, but would not have created this urban relationship between the city, the city and, the, uh, um, and the opera house as it is now. Next. And then uh, some developments never carried out actually of the corridor. And this, uh, the corridor as it is, this is going up around one of the auditoria. You can see actually this is the arch of Sydney Harbour Bridge. Next. And to come back to these shells, I, I mentioned the fact that these are Hogan's tiles uh, that he, he realized you couldn't get any kind of perfection to these tiles up up on those shells and therefore decided to precast the tiles into lids and put the lids on top of the concrete. And all these seams, for example, in this thing are made out of this difference between uh, glazed and matte tiles. So that where the lids join, you get this matte tile seam. Next. Next. And then the development of the geometry of the shells. Next. And uh, this being the lid system that goes onto these uh, ribs, producing this is the final result. And this being the, please don't ask me to explain it, the segments, the segments of the shells inside the sphere. Next. And then the lids going on to these, uh, the making of the ribs before the lids, rather. And here, the, the, the model from which the segments of the shells are made. Next. Next. And, uh, well, this again shows the shells and the, the shell form and the, uh, the form of the auditorium inside the shells. So that you have, within the tradition, of, within Western tradition anyway, you know, a shell, and inside the shell, a, uh, another volume. So you have a representative shell and inside another shell. I mean, this almost every Western dome you can think of uh, plays this game. This Brunelleschi's dome. Next. And then this thing, which was never realized, this, what, this is what was bit, was a series of plywood uh, um, bronze-faced uh, uh, plywood uh, uh, elements, U's, that were meant to, to be built up of components that would adjust uh, their, their rate of uh, the form of their catenary so that uh, faceted glass could fill in the shells and also then relate to vertical glass that could, that, that that coincided with the paving pattern. I mean, it's a sort of crazy project to make the geometry of the inside of the shells relate actually to the paving on, on the podium. Never carried out, and this kind of uh, welded, thin, light welded uh, uh, fenestration was what was finally adopted. Next. And then the inner in the auditorium, not by Utsun at all, and this public uh, terrace. Uh, you know, on the water where the, where the shells come, where the two auditorium come forward to be. Next. In 64, he did this project for Zurich, which also was not uh, carried out. 
uh, opera in, in Zurich. One, one in competition, but not built. And uh, with, uh, you know, pagoda in the form of folded slab, kind of nervy-like folded slab, uh, and treating it again as a kind of city in miniature with an agora that is uh, um, glass, of course, separating the foyer of the, of the, of the auditory, which is treated like an amphitheater uh, with almost no proscenium at all. And then going around it, uh, bars and restaurants opening onto this uh, court, and you go, there, therefore you, you, you enter, the public enters up into this space, it's sort of embraced by the theater, and then you go into the theater, with a, with a special sort of poche uh, cachère at the side to, for cars. Thanks. Well, now Herman Central here. I mean, this, you could say, is just pure flattery, but uh, I, I think Central Bahia is, is a canonical work. And, uh, and I, one, I, this is not Central Bahia, of course, but I, I, I think that um, it is the, the laundry and the little Montessori school in Delft, and they are, uh, well, they are, I mean, the way I read these drawings is, is a kind of cellular growth system with a kind of city in miniature inside the school, uh, which also grows with the, with the cells around it, which you could say are the residential fabric growing around the public space. And uh, of course, one could show here also, and I did, but I got so many slides, I decided to cut, take, take it out. Uh, this building, Alderman Eich, surely, and the whole, uh, uh, I suppose one has to say, structuralist tradition and, and, and of course one could talk a lot about the link between that and, and uh, a, a sort of anthropological attitude and, and a looking to, to North Africa, for example, in particular, uh, looking anyway for anthropological model. And I suppose there is a parallel between looking for that anthropological model and Utzon's transcultural interests, you know, the, the Utzon, I mean, and actually, there is an interesting connection because um, Aska Yorn, who is, um, what is the name of this? Cobra. Cobra, right. I mean, there is this link, you see. Aska Yorn is a very close friend of Woodson. There is this connection between, Cobra, between Van Eyck. I, mean, I see a connection between Cobra and Van Eyck. And, and of course, Aska Yorn and therefore Woodson. I mean, this kind of thing. Uh, next, and uh, well, I think Central Bahia is obviously a kind of city in miniature. In fact, it, I mean the the, the Avon project for Central Bahia is in fact uh, Herman's entry for Amsterdam City Hall. And uh, well, uh, I feel a lot of things. I mean, about cultural roots, there are a lot of things to be said. I mean, there is a certain root. Uh, in my opinion, that runs to Franklin Wright. There's a certain, certain connections that run to Kahn. Um, next, and there are and there are certain crises also that are built into. I mean, uh, again, this business of a canon, which is, I mean, I think this question of a canon involves this this fertility of the idea. Uh, both in relation to its own actual situation and also in, in terms of what it pl uh, implies or desires, in a way. I mean, the, this uh, city in miniature, which is in any way isolated in Appledore by the railroad on the one hand and auto route on another, implies, I take it, by this photograph, which has been always, is always there, you know, that somehow or other there should be a pedestrian link between the city and miniature of Central Bahia and the city. But of course, the, one has this feeling that it never was quite possible. Or it's a gesture which, you know, in this sense, is pointing towards the future. Next. And then this connection I'm trying to make here between Larkin. This is uh, this is Larkin uh, being used for political purposes, but and and the the central space of Larkin, 1904, Franklin Wright, and, and the, the interstitial high space of Central Bahia. Next. 
And then I think very important, and, and I, I, I'm not going to do it today, but I have tried, and I still think it's valid, to compare Norman Foster's uh, um, Willis Paper Dumas insurance building in, in uh, Ipswich to this building, because the dates are about the same. Uh, the, 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 the client is very similar, insurance company moving out of capital city to a uh, provincial city in order to stabilize labor force and create better conditions and cheaper land value, etc., etc., using telecommunications for that purpose and so on. And, uh, uh, but the, the attitude is, well, actually both architects distantly and in different ways influenced by Franklin Wright, but, the, but then uh, from this point onwards the attitude towards uh, open office space, Bureau Landschaft, post-war German invention, I think, you know, is very different. In, in Herman's case, the Bureau Landschaft is sort of cellular and, as you know, broken up and so on and so forth. In, in uh, uh, Norman's, it's left as loft space. And here, of course, this famous illustration showing the relationship between the actual literal structure and the space structure and the, then the furniture structure and the possibility of permutation, living permutation of that furniture structure in relation to the open Bureau Landschaft, not so open as the Foster version of Bureau Landschaft. Next. And then this kind of tectonic, uh, this business of making the way the building is built, uh, Villa de Duc, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, Louis Kahn, Jorn Hudson, I mean, the, you know, the language coming out of the way in which the building is made. Next. And of course, this business, the way in which the building is made and so on, the, the actual cellular results of the building being partly a direct consequence of its mode of assembly. Next. Next. And uh, consequences of that for the city in miniature as a kind of also device for providing outside space on, for certain privileged floors, use of the roof and so on. Next. And the problem of the city in miniature in terms of its outside, I was thinking when uh, 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 Herman was talking about uh, Hans Scharun, it reminded me of a story about uh, um, a German students going to Hans Scharun and talking to him about the Philharmonie. And at some point, one student asks uh, Scharun, but her professor, what about the outside? And he looks at him for a while, a very strange expression on his face, and says, uh, but it has an outside? Uh, end of statement. And I think that this uh, problem of outside, I mean, it's interesting that Herman would uh, justify his choice of the library on its inside and not on its outside. And the problem of the outside, you know, the, how do you get into the building exactly? You know, uh, where is the, this, this dilemma? Labyrinth, how do you get into a labyrinth? You know, this, this problem. Uh, um, and also, what is the building body finally? You know, this kind of problem, which I think. I mean, if I may say so, I think that Herman's work is, is moving, I mean, is developing to, to come to terms with what is the body of the building outside. Next. <laughs> and then, of course, the, the, the old nightmare of the automobile, you know, and, and how do you get, you know, the different experience of getting into it by automobile, which in any way is probably the way most people get into it, as opposed to getting into it as pedestrian. Next. Next. All right, and then we come to uh, uh, Ziza, Alvaro Ziza, uh, uh, Bank uh, Oliviera de Ashmes in, I can't pronounce that correctly, but in Pogor do Azim, no, sorry, that's the one I'm talking about. Uh, Oliviera de Ashmes, the, the bank in, in that, that's the town, 76. And this is an early model, and that, of course, is. Uh, one of those uh, or self uh, self re reflective image of Arzizer drawing himself drawing and this this kind of uh, very uh, strong uh, I think well a reading of that drawing is this very strong feeling for the body next and this is the no direction. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's the kind of one. Because you're talking about culture. Uh, yeah, right. 
So, I mean, what impressed me about this building is uh, an incredible modest building, uh, as many of his earlier buildings are, and, and I think this spirit of modesty remains in, in, in his work. But, but modesty does not mean uh, uh, lack of energy or lack of ambition. I incredibly modest in terms of the way the building uh, uh, accommodates itself uh, urbanistically. Actually, these buildings, I don't know whether, I made, whether it becomes obvious, but this urban issue is, I think, present in, in a lot of these buildings. And, and, uh, and the way in which also the building uh, internalizes uh, the, the cultural legacy of the modern movement. I mean, there, there are aspects of this building that obviously are de uh, uh, derived from Alta. There are aspects of this building which, which I suppose have their origins in Holland, this fe fenestration. Uh, I mean, alto, it seems to me, the actual uh, organic manipulation of the space itself. Or this element, which seems to me to perhaps be Holland, but could even be Mendelssohn. You know, there is sort of aspects of Mendelssohn and of alto and of uh, perhaps Deuker in, in this building. But, but they are not identical. You cannot say this is that, you know. They are all transformed. And, and that, I think, this question of transformation is, is uh, uh, one, of, one of the astonishing aspects of his work, and, and it's canonical in that sense, that this idea of transformation of language, I, I love this aphorism <coughs> of his, architects don't invent anything, they transform reality. I, I, I think it's this idea of transformation in every level is, I think, uh, astonishing. Next. Next. And, uh, well, just the way this building relates to this existing fabric, of course, the way in which it I also, the uh, other thing I like about his thinking is this idea of context and the whole fashion of contextualism. And then his sort of Zen-like attitude that one has to choose between, uh, at certain moments you have to uh, 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 respond to what's coming to you from the context. And in other moments you have to challenge the context. The idea that you should do the two things maybe at the same time. I think this is very present in this building. It both responds to the context in terms of its scale and its line and so on. And at the same time, it challenges the context, you know, and, and, and revitalizes the context, I think. Thanks. And, uh, well, then this is the same thing, this kind of intimacy. I mean, the astonishing intimacy of this little building. I mean, the way it is both, it is both monumental and not, you know. Uh, it both has a, a grandeur, and yet it's incredibly intimate. You know, look at the scale of these people at this uh, gate and so on. Next. And uh, that intimacy, of course, is picked up inside the building. Next. Next. And uh, then there is this whole complex business of, of, uh, of generating this space and the way in which this space spirals up uh, to disappear, so to speak, into a kind of attic-like vortex, which you can find in a lot of his work. And, and this, of course, has its origins in Alto, but it is, again, also totally transformed. And, I mean, the, the, the kind of very, well, again, almost like automatic writing, this, this uh, uh, taking of certain forms from points on boundaries, you know, uh, simply to inscribe, I mean, this idea of, on the one hand, automatic, sort of, and on the other hand, the idea of inscribing, very topographic, the work is extremely topographic, the idea of inscribing it into the site. Next. And then, the, the, well, this is the spatial views inside. Uh, it's not very representative, but I think you know it. This, this kind of vortex that runs up to the administration levels and into a kind of vault disappearing. Next. Khan. The next one is Khan's Kimball. And, um, and I show these two images for uh, one of which is Billy Le Duke, of course, very well known, and the other is Kant. Uh, this is number eight. I realize this is rather long, but uh, seven, it's the same, more or less the same date as Central Alba here, uh, uh, Kimball. And, uh, you know, what, what I find in, in, in intriguing in Kant is one, this, uh, this French education he had, basically, although it was all in Philadelphia, Echo de Beaux Arts. And the Echo de Beaux-Arts that is very conscious of the other, so to speak, of structural rationalism, Paul Cray uh, would have, we know, you know, have taught all this French theory about structural rationalism. 
and uh, and Villa Duc having this kind of importance, and the, and this whole business of the syntax being derived from the uh, mode of assembly. But the other thing I think that comes out in Villa Le Duc is this idea of a kind of a reciprocity between the old uh, traditional uh, material of building and manner of building and some unprecedented new uh, technological uh, manner of building. So that the armature of the lightweight metal armature, relatively speaking, projected here by Villa Le Duc with its own unprecedented language is dropped into the masonry Rundbogenstiel Romanesque casing, you know, as indeed uh, uh, the idea coming from the Bruce, in fact. And then Kahn, it seems to me that these are the two aspects that one has in Kahn, this business of coming to terms with modernization. And one of the things which he tries to do with a lot of pathos is this parking garage, you know, because I, well, I think it must be true also here, automobile again, you know, all parking garages are like the ultimate alienated, alienated and alienating box, you know, in which are these tin things which you have to try to get into and out of without, uh, you know, suffering a mild schizophrenic attack in the process. And, and, and or without an even more disastrous physical accident. And, and, uh, and they, they sit there as, as you know, the, the, the degree zero of 20th century life in the middle, well, certainly in the United States, in the middle of cities. And, um, and this effort to transform this thing, never built, you know, into, uh, uh, you know, to, to encase it in, in, in living space, so to speak, or space in which people work, offices, hotels, and, and of course, to, to make it a change point between the, the automobile and the, and being a human being on two feet, and, uh, and then making its language, you know, I mean, on the one hand, confronting the technology itself of the, of the motopia, and on the other hand, transforming, uh, I, I mean, on the other hand, deriving its language from the mode of, of, of production of the, of the building, uh, uh, reinforced concrete columns that, in fact, of course, increase their dimension as they descend to the ground and uh, have these uh, day work joints. Next. And when it comes to Kimball, what intrigues me about Kimball, why I think Kimball is canonical, is because it seems to me that Kimball confronts without resolving two ideas about space. Because uh, if you go back now to, well, same date, interestingly enough, if you say Kimball, uh, Central Behair, and uh, Willis Faber Duma, uh, the, 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 the problem of uh, unprecedented, uh, undesignated open space is, uh, you know, is as much applying to Bureau Landschaft, to open office space, as it is to open gallery space. So that, you know, the ideal is to make a gallery in which anybody could do anything, and it should just have flexible panels, which is what uh, Foster does, it, by the way, in uh, Sainsbury Center, of course, is to make Bureau Landschaft gallery. And, and, uh, and this tension between, on the one hand, recognizing that modernity is looking or calling for this undesignated uh, space, and on the other hand, recognizing that uh, the aura of cultural objects requires space of contemplation, therefore room, you know. And I think that Kimball is, is, attempts this kind of impossible proof of the two things coexisting. So on the one hand, uh, Kahn has this whole business about room. I mean, one big difference between Kahn and Mies is that Mies would accept the suspended ceiling. Kahn totally rejects the suspended ceiling, which is also uh, the position of Hudson. Because the character of the room should be made by the structure that makes the room. It's the Villa de Duc story. And this is what this is all about in this famous image of his about the room. And then this sketch of Kimball shows a room, of course, you know, very similar to this room. Next. And, uh, and sometimes, of course, the, the room also becomes an auditorium, as it does in this case. This is the general plan of Kimball, the main level. You come in here through a grove of trees, uh, actually in front of each of these open portico vaults, not shown on the drawing, unfortunately, are water fountains, exactly the same dimension. And entrance in the park through a grove, a gravel yard and grove of trees to this space. With these courts, or ornamental courts, and this is the vault, of course, vault and a half, or vault and a piece, vault and a space, 
uh, scene carrying the, the uh, somewhat uncomfortably the lecture theater. One of the paradoxes about Kimball is that almost all the people who come to Kimball, I know the statistic is something like 70% or something, come by automobile. So they come into the back of Kimball and come in underneath and up these staircases. Whereas the, the ideal honorific entrance, of course, is from the park, but most people do not come from the park. We are back with the same uh, 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 dilemma. Uh, but there is this, uh, you know, the, it's a canon that is full of, uh, it's a very beautiful building, I think, but it's also full of a certain pathos of this, of this unrecon unreconcilable uh, uh, problem. Next. And then there is this, uh, I think, very elegiac entrance through this gravel yard with these low trees. Uh, you, 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 you enter under this vault, and then the gravel yard works on the cross axis. And um, these vaults are, un, are, with the exception of the two vaults at the portico, are not vaults, but are folded plates. And the early projects for Kimball are, in fact, monitor factory folded plate construction. Next. And uh, when well, you see the, the folded plate is shown here very clearly because this is a folded, a long concrete beam, in fact. And, and uh, with, with, with just ties between uh, these vaults, but they're not really vaults at all. And so even uh, you have vault, not vault, you have reference to historical vault, but actually it's folded plate. So there's again this kind of double uh, tradition and innovation, tradition and modernity, the uh, post-tension vault tables and the nature of the vault shown on the next. And then the space itself in this direction makes rooms. I mean, this is perhaps a very good example because it's also the way through to the restaurant, I mean, coming back in this direction. But this is the typical gallery space making rooms uh, with actually screens that are fitted, that fit into the service channels, as you probably know, on underneath the seam space. So in this direction you have rooms, and in the other direction you have this open loft space. Next. And well, you know, this whole business about light and so on, and I mean, the whole business of trying to deal with ultraviolet light, by the way, and, and, but keeping some natural light. This other argument about modernization and art, you know, after all these years, art sitting in palaces with no problem at all, you know, curators who are maximizing the preservation of artwork, of course, above all paper, but also all artwork, you know, would prefer to have no natural light at all, because then, of course, you know, that's it, you know, it's secure forever. But uh, well, this is the dilemma. Next. All right, and then Maneo, uh, the museum in Merida, We're getting closer, 86, and I have one more to go. Um, and again, I don't have quite the right plan. I'm sorry to say I have the roof plan, but I should have the uh, main floor plan. But uh, basically, there is a library administration and curatorial wing that goes to the right of this direction. And then there is the warehouse museum. I, I mean, I think that's you know, quite deliberately the way it's been conceived as a kind of warehouse museum. And vis-a-vis -vis this question of context, I mean, uh, I, I mean, uh, it goes without saying there was quite some battle between the architect and the archaeologists over this question of not seeing all the pieces of the Roman remains as sacrosanct, and so then this uh, conservation. And then, uh, you know, well, first of all, the building makes got, uh, makes Roman references by use of Roman bit bricks and use of Roman arches, but in this direction, of course, makes other references. I mean, you could say not exactly Gothic, but somehow medieval references, perhaps. Or anyway, 19th century warehouse tradition reference, you know, a, a mixture of these two. Uh, and of course, vernacular <coughs> roof tiles. More, of course, you could say there is something here that, that is obviously uh, relates to right uh, next. And well, the, this and the domesticity, so to speak, of the library block, uh, well, sort of 
it's, it's ambiguous, partly kind of domestic, partly warehouse again, but less warehouse than the actual museum itself. Next. And then this undercroft, which is penetrated by these piers, uh, linked by a tunnel to nearby Roman remains so that one can pass from the excavated city to these amphitheater with, with, with uh, thinking one's almost just sort of like next door to the building, but one passes sort of imperceptibly by quite a long tunnel out to these remains. Next. And uh, then, this, of course, this play between the existing Roman remains around the amphitheater and the actual arches used in the main hall of the warehouse museum space. Next. And this, the tunnel, you, there you see the distance between the tunnel and the building, and also the atmosphere of warehouse in actually storage part of the building. Next. And warehouse again, you know, on the back side of the building. This is front side, back side of storage part of the building. Next. Storage meaning museum. And then this kind of uh, gallery space lit from above. Very much the spirit, I think, still of museum as warehouse. You know. Next. And well, just details of this door, this sort of more honorific treatment of the building at this end where there's the library. Next. Next. All right, then I have one more. I, that's one more building and... It's still a fragment from Maneo. Yeah, well, the, the, the bridge over the Roman road Next. And again, the same thing, the connection between the two parts. Next. Are you going to, uh, uh, Right, and the detail of this, you know, quasi-industrial, quasi-domestic detail of this block, which of course becomes rather strange up here, you know, in terms of this balance between domesticity and, and utility. Next. All right, and then I just showed this last image because of the relationship between the building and, and the city. I, it's rather inadequate, but I mean, I, uh, actually, I don't know, it's always been my hypothesis, and uh, Ignazi will no doubt correct me, that in a way, Merida never really had a Gothic period, in a sense. That it, it fell uh, after the Roman Empire into total decay, in a sense, basically. And I think, I feel, but of course it's a uh, very typical critic's hypothesis, that this uh, part of the metaphor of this facade is like the medieval reference that the city never had, you know. Next. Yeah. All right, and then Foster and the connection to... Uh, yeah, well, the, this is this, you know, this is what's used in Sainsbury for, munis uh, for museum, open bureau lunch. And, and here, of course, is, you know, the demiurge father figure sitting on the floor, <laughs> Richard Buckminster Fuller, you know, and, uh, and the boys, you know, in the <laughs> early days of the Foster office. And um, the Buckminster Fuller had enormous influence in London uh, in the 60s and well, late 50s and 60s. He uh, terrified architects by uh, giving lectures and uh, telling them that most architects don't know how much their buildings weigh, which I thought was uh, uh, an obvious absurdity until Georges last night told me that, uh, you know, it's quite right, you know, that most architectural students haven't the finest idea how much anything weighs, and uh, as, a, as opposed to art students. Then. But, and I suppose Bucky Fuller was probably closer <coughs> to an art student than to an architect. In any event, uh, I think there's absolutely no question that Fuller had more influence on England than on any other country in Europe, and also probably more influence on England than on America, as a matter of fact. Though there's certainly that, that uh, Fuller had an influence on Karl. Um, next. And, well, of course, the production side of, on the one hand, you know, production of geodesic dome, 
Fuller in his prime, and on the other, uh, the Crystal Palace, and this kind of cultural background to the Foster position. Next. And what I think is interesting is the transformation game, because though Fuller was the father, you know, this is US Marine Corps dome, and, and although this hypothesis probably only made real valid sense in survival conditions, you know, although making, you know, I, I mean, Fuller himself lived in a home, a, a, a dome, Rome home to a dome being one of his uh, little uh, slogans, and uh, lived in it with his kind of uh, uptight, uh, uh, you know, 18th century American furniture, which didn't quite fit with the, uh, uh, the inclined side of the dome. Uh, and, um, I mean, getting into a dome, all these problems which Fuller could never solve, here, of course, solved by the fact you just lift it up, and uh, there it is. But uh, this, this is this kind of uh, fanatical inspiration would appeal to a country that so, has been so, so deeply empirical in its, uh, and puritanical. And then, and then this transformation of it in this uh, Climatron office uh, of uh, Norman Foster 59 project for Sweden, where it's not quite right, you see. I mean, all of uh, Fuller's idealism is being kind of shifted. And this, uh, certainly it's space frame construction, but already the, the, the escalator game, which will appear in uh, uh, Willis' favor, is there, you know. And, and the dome isn't uh, the perfect uh, Archimedean number that Fuller wants the dome to be, you know. Isn't the dome at all, in fact, really. Next. Next. And uh, then the other, the, the building, of course, is Stadstead. And uh, because I think that it's canonical in that uh, if there is a building type which is processal and which one can never find one's way around, uh, uh, with, with some exceptions, but generally speaking, if one takes London Airport, for example, or Kennedy, but I know there are others, uh, I suppose Charles de Gaulle, you could say, is a little easier or something, and maybe Schiphol at the beginning, and maybe will be later, I don't know. But in any case, airport is a real nightmare. Uh, the fact that the building is never finished, for example, this, this, this the, the quintessential building of process, in a way. And um, what I think is intriguing about Stansted, which Ignazi has seen and I haven't, but uh, is this uh, very strong determination to make the building into a kind of terminus in the sense that a railway station was a terminus and that uh, and to maintain the uh, land side air side relationship as stable so that I mean this is the invention I think which is rather brilliant so that the, the terminal building would extend in this direction but land side and air side would remain stable and uh, uh, this being land side of course and and uh, that, I think, is, uh, makes it uh, kind of canonical. And the reason why I'm showing it here with Dulles uh, Airport, Washington, by um, Aero Saarinen, is that, of course, Saarinen tries to do something of the sort, but, but, of course, in a way, can't deal with it. I mean, he, he also uses mobile lounges. Well, in fact, of course, in the end, uh, uh, Stansted did not use mobile lounges. And, the, and here, of course, one can, can point to this problem of architecture and society and architecture and technocrats, for example, and technocrats with vested interests. Because um, I don't know how, how many of you have been to Milan Airport, but they have a system of uh, astonishing buses there made by this company called Vantool, which are, are double-ended buses and so on and so forth. I mean, they, they, they are incredibly efficient in terms of shifting people out of terminal building to aircraft and back again. And uh, why one can't opt for this kind of solution is something that just escapes me. But anyway, British Aircraft Authority wouldn't have this solution. So the, the, the system of, as I understand it, I may be, I don't know if it's quite right, the system of conveyance to the craft aircraft from the terminal building was, was never properly uh, uh, developed and Foster lost complete control over that aspect. The air side is not at all controlled by them. And uh, in this case, which was with mobile lounges, but the problem there was that the actual machinery was such a clunky, irrational machine, really, you know, I mean, that, 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 that never worked, really, 
And also, of course, what you get is the typical uh, 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 Saranen rhetoric, you know. I mean, it's as though this building were facing something, you know, I mean, in some kind of dramatic way. I mean, what brings one back, I hadn't realized it. Now I realize that I'm coming back to my first number one. I, it didn't occur to me that I was doing that. But I, I, I and, and uh, um, I, I mean, there's a sort of pathos built into the idea of terminal building in the case of Sarnon, which is absolutely rhetorical and, and ridiculous, I think, you know. And whereas here it is, it is uh, much more rationally conceived, I think, and, and I, 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 I will try to see it this week, this coming weekend, in fact. But next. So here, air side, and uh, this is the terminal, and this is the area in which the terminal will expand. And here's the parking and rail connection underneath, and this is the rhetoric of the portico, made out of the same elements, of course, that the actual uh, shed itself is made out of. Next. And then the, uh, the, the, the openness of the shed, this is the lower level, and in, in fact I need an upper level, but I don't have it, which, which, which shows the back baggage handling and all the rest of it, but the shed is organized in such a way above, on the level above, so that the division between ingoing and outgoing uh, passengers can be uh, modified and are simply screen divided within the one space. And uh, this being the space, which uh, is just this uh, very sort of rational structural uh, <coughs> system, crystal palace-like system, uh, with very uh, careful light modulation in the in the in the crest of these things. Next. And, um, and this rather brilliant game of these trees which also carry the service. And, and here the connection to Khan is interesting because in Sainsbury Centre and in, and in other buildings by Foster, the servant served argument present in Khan is replicated here, you know, where, and also what you also get from Khan is you don't get suspended ceiling. I mean, one of their big victories was not to do suspended ceiling and to have uh, you know, indirect light and natural light on this light ceiling and, and put all the services into these shafts uh, or into the floor, but nothing in the ceiling. I mean, again, to make a, a tectonic space you know, and to give the, 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 the terminal its character, as in railway stations of the 19th century, their character through the, through the tectonic space itself. Next. Yeah. Well, this is just more of the same. Next. Next. This, this is uh, this kind of very ingenious system to give a very lean uh, uh, cornice to the top of the building, uh, but to give it a cornice, in fact, on this uh, portico. Next. And uh, just to make a comment about future, I do not wish to suggest that uh, Harry Wolf's uh, entry for a Osaka Airport competition was really influenced by uh, Foster. But this attempt to, which is present in this building, I mean, I'm looking to a future, really, arguing that this building is uh, pushing out, you know, to return to the idea of an intimacy between the uh, uh, person who's, who's traveling by air to sort of have some kind of more direct contact with the machine that you are going to go into you know, under this canopy roof which also designed by Arab but not by the same team. Next. Right. Well, that's it. Okay. And well th I mean all of this of course being given by the by the by the competition conditions, but and therefore, of course, no, uh, the, the whole mobile lounge thing just got rid of by bringing the, the, the planes underneath it. But that was established by competition conditions. But uh, anyway, of course, I cheated. But uh, but it's not a bit. It's not built as a project. But uh, not going to be built either. Uh, piano building will be built instead. But I. I I realize that to, that it's a long way from, from uh, Alvaro Ziza's bank in 
in uh, uh, Olivier de Schmitz to uh, foster standstill. Uh, but the conditions, of course, are also very, very different. And uh, I think that uh, there is a kind of topographic responsibility in both cases, I would say. I mean, I think that the, 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 the foster building is a topographic response to the landscape. And to, uh, of course, it is, you know, it, it is, a, it is a ex urban by, by definition, stands there. It is, uh, you know, the, the terminal building in Motopia, no longer, uh, uh, you know, having any kind of real relationship with the city as such, but only with an urbanized region. But uh, uh, whereas Olivier de Oshmes is a little village still with a very definite urban uh, culture and life and all the rest of it, despite the fact, I don't know if you've noticed it, you know, the way in which uh, this little bank building is buried by automobiles, you know. Uh, uh, okay, that's it. Thank you very much again for your really very detailed account of the business. Um, I think uh, before we uh, go apart, I think it should be good that we have uh, we try to discuss not so much, let's say, what you said, but to discuss the two, we tried to discuss the two approaches which were in a way brought today to you, let's say the approach of somebody like Hermann, Herman, who in a way even uh, apologizes for his approach at the end, but well, of course which, uh, it's a very important approach which deals with, uh, let's say, with direct impulses towards what he thinks are, let's say, the things which are uh, in his view, for the people to discuss. And uh, the approach you gave, in which, let's say, you in a way withdraw a little bit from, let's say, from your, uh, let's say, from your direct choice by trying to find, let's, to define the idea of canonical in a way that it has this, uh, this somewhere between uh, a past and a future. And I think this also, in a way, declares the, di the distance a little bit more you have to the subjects, which, you know, it's, uh, it's the approach very shortly. But I like, uh, if possible, it should be nice to have a, a sort of discussion about these two things more than about perhaps why did you didn't say this about Stanford or not. But we can do this, of course, because then it should be also the case to the work of her. Is there somebody who wants to make a comment or Central question, but quite uh, tangent yeah. or tangential one. Now, at the beginning of your list, there is three or maybe four. This uh, the Hallen uh, second example, the Hallen uh, Sidlum, the Hansa Viertel apartments, and in some sense, miss not the Sidlum building, but Chicago buildings for housing. Now, who raised the problem of, of, of the house? What I think is a, is a main subject of, because I have the, the same problem, but a main subject is that, that the problem of the house seems to disappear of the, in the last 30 years in, in modern architecture. Uh, more and more, your list, but probably my list also, <laughs> lose uh, housing and goes to um, public and uh, emblematic buildings. Yeah. And that's, I don't know, if that's also that architecture as, let's say, institution, has lose housing. 
had recatched housing. <laughs> this is more of the <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting uh, observation. I, I, I think it's very sharp and, and I the, the, yeah I think and also the last part, not by chance it did um, some re somehow what uh, the Populism, yeah, uh, populism uh, uh, was able to some extent to recapture it, um, but at a certain price, I think, you know, with this recapturing uh, operation, and it's very, very unclear what the what the situation is in a way. You know, I mean, I'm thinking I know better the states, of course, but, um, because the. Well, now, of course, no one's doing anything, but, or hardly nothing at all. But, uh, um, I mean, in, in actual reality, which may also be true in other countries as well, I mean, the, I mean, the, the statistic goes something like 80% of the built production of the United States, even more than that, I think, is uh, without any intervention of any architect at all. And a large chunk of this 80% must be housing, the house building industry in the United States. So the recapturing operation of the postmodern is uh, sort of partial, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it is able to make images and maybe persuade some developers to use these images in order to market housing. But, uh, um, and that I think is, is a sort of situation in a way, in the States in a way. A long time ago I was struck by, I, I never, uh, did anything with it, but I once went to um, uh, these buildings built by, maybe I told you this, by uh, Cesar Pelle in, uh, in Houston, which are called Four Leaf Towers. And in those days, which is the, I think the late 70s, uh, they were very expensive apartments. Now, now they're of course not so expensive, but they were over half a million dollars a piece. I think slightly more than half a million dollars a piece. And they were sort of, I don't know, maybe uh, six room apartments, something like that. And they, the plans were just nightmare, you know, just horrible. Uh, actually, they were real estate development plans. I mean, they, they were not designed by Pelly at all. They were designed by the real estate people. And a great deal of uh, stuff in the United States is designed by real estate and not designed by the architects. And I remember thinking at that time of, of uh, Kadirk's uh, Saria housing and, and, and uh, how very beautiful are the plans of Kudok's uh, housing and how, uh, how in a way also accessible in the sense of accessibility is, is Kudok's, uh, uh, that housing of Kudok, I think, placed entirely in brick and so on and with this very uh, sensitive landscape and so on. And, uh, but I think you're right, you know. I have been shocked, for example, we show carefully that plan of the sensitive housing of mm. by, by Amazon, which is very impressive, this this mm. housing plan. Mm -hmm. And but I'm asking myself yeah. till which point this is canonical or it's well, was finished. canonical. Well, it's, it's only finished in the United States. Because I think that in, in certain parts of Europe, uh, for mm. instance, Holland and, and, and Portugal, uh, I mean, someone, I don't know who, choose uh, Evra, but uh, <coughs> we will, one of these days here, comment on that. And in Finland, for instance, I mean, uh, housing is not taken over by postmodernism, and even not uh, by the difference between building and architecture, which you mentioned in point four. So, I don't don't you think you are uh, too uh, pessimistic uh, on that point? Mm -hmm. okay. Thomas, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm trying to understand the kind of uh, inherent logic 
which is behind both selections of uh, Hermann Hertzberger this morning and of uh, yours just right now, which I think this is also the purpose of the seminar somehow. And if I, as far as I can try to find this kind of uh, logic that justifies or combines or puts together these ten buildings, selected, with exceptions, but in terms of the main rule. I would say that in the first presentation, uh, I think a problem is posed that the selection is done on the fact that we are dealing with modern architecture, which has a kind of primitive quality and I think this needs to be a little more discussed. And secondly, that we have architectures where uh, possibly the role of the public social space, specifically the ground floor, I would say, is a very important uh, issue. Uh, in your case, I would say that, uh, as far as I understand, we are dealing with a series of paradoxes concerning uh, the project of modernity. For example, the paradox between silence versus eloquence, or flexibility of space versus the necessity for, for room definition, or the paradox between innovative modesty and a kind of rationalized gesture. And uh, all this, so I, I get the idea that if the two first things are what are proposed by Hermann Herzberger, uh, for, from you what comes out is that Finally, there is an ultimate paradox that we are dealing with, which is that we have to try to reconcile, and I think perhaps your uh, notion of transformation is it's involved into this, this kind of paradoxes. So if, I mean, this, is, this is how far I, I have gone, trying to understand the kind of logic which is behind, and I think we can, I would like to have some kind of comments on, on this. What? What? No, I can't. Yeah, I think that is behind, uh, uh, in different ways, behind uh, my choice. I think, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, you know, only when you say it like that, do I see that it's sort of present in every case, practically. You know, but uh, but I guess it is there. You know, it is the it is the You know, even the first one, for example, is, I mean, the reason why I like this work is got to do with its, uh, um, the way which it is a model for a very bold gesture towards a sort of urban conglomeration, you know. Uh, and, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's other things attached to it, like the relationship to history also. But, but it has that kind of uh, boldness which, um, is what could be one way of dealing with the overwhelming mass of, of urbanized material, you know, that is the megalopolis, you know, or metropolis. You know. And then I, I see it partly as having importance or canonical value because of the uh, because of the heroic way, and uh, you know, it, it sort of confronts that. You know. I mean, it's not the only thing, but. So I think that, uh, and then you know that theme, but not always the same, not always the same opposition, but uh, oppositions arising out of modernization, you know, uh, uh, appears in, in every case. Maybe not so much in the bank of, uh, of Ziza, uh, although you, I mean, I, I was struck when I was looking at my own slides again uh, uh, about the automobile, you know, the way. Um, the way it's so present, you know, because the building is so diminutive in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an urban fabric which is also diminutive. You know. I mean, if I understood it well, I mean, if you use the paradox, the word paradox, in a way, it uh, already uh, in 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 it is inherent that there is, let's say, there is no reconciliation between, let's say, the past or present or future and things like this. So the problem is whether the word itself is a good word. I think what you were dealing with was that, in fact, if those two sides 
are in the building as references. So it opens up to something and it includes something from another side. And in fact, there is a, a little, that is, there is no paradox. There is a sort of so that word transformation is quite another word. But I was surprised that in some instances in you, I am surprised that the, at the end of the series, the references to the past seems to be as more stronger than what could op than the opening up. Then, or let's say, the, in that, I have this head feeling with the Monet old building in a way that there are, you know, there are all those how to deal with an any the middle age thing. And I, I don't know the building, I must say. And I only saw the pictures, but I don't, I didn't understand. But it seems to me that it happens more with the buildings which were in this in the end of the series. So that seems to mean something for the condition of the new buildings than the buildings you were mentioning from the first one, perhaps the distance is bigger to it in a way. It's a sort of observation I want to make. But in what way do you think uh, Merida and uh, Stansted are the same? They're they are not the same, same. same. they're this different one. I, I, I was only pointing out especially at the Monet thing, which mm, yeah. I can't see the opening up in a way mm. yeah. towards uh, yeah. future as a big word. But I mean, what I think is, uh, uh, I think is of value in that work is this, uh, well, uh, at the same time, respectful but also aggressive attitude towards uh, uh, history. You know, I think the double movement of being having respect but also it's a bit like the the, the I see it a bit like the Zizer position, you know, of uh, responding to context and uh, uh, confronting it. And uh, that, I think, is, I find, a very strong aspect of the building. I mean, that all, all the aspect of the building that opens to future. Yeah. But... Yeah. I, I would like to say something about... Uh, a little bit about what, what, uh, what you were saying. You must realize, and that I didn't state explicitly, my difficulty has been that I made a sort of, I had a sort of hesitation between those buildings that were, that, that had, that were inspiring me most, and that buildings, that I think if it is necessary, uh, if it is possible for me at all to, 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 to look at them from a certain distance, which May, may be canonical, you know. So, in fact, I am unable to have this distance because I am, so to say, um, it is something like egocentric, you know. I, I look, my, 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 my way of looking to buildings is too much um, uh, like stealing, like eating, you know. So I cannot, I cannot look at the building without eating it for my own purposes, you know. So it's, it's not a right, it's in no way an objective, and the slightest attempt to be objective. So this makes my position so different from, from, from the other positions. I don't know, you don't agree, but I mean, this is, this is, this is, uh, at least, I, I mean, I think when, when I hear Ken talking about his buildings, I think he's very wise, he's, he has this distance to see it in this difference, which, which, which I, I haven't got. So it's not so much an intuitive thing, but it's just that I, I am, I'm looking at them in terms of what should I have done? What, what, what can I learn from it? For my, uh, uh, you know? That's one thing. The other thing is that um, talking about primitive and so on, maybe, and also about paradoxes in, in what, what Ken is, is putting on the table, maybe we could think in terms of layeredness. Mm. And for me, an, 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 uh, one of the main um, uh, criteria for the quality is is it layered? Is it is it layered in the sense that that uh, you know are there enough paradoxes? Are there enough things you can't solve? 
So as not because I love the, uh, the, the unsolved, but I think I don't want to feel, I think, I think this is what I, more or less a proposal. Let's not, let's, let's not uh, jump in that pitfall of that we want to solve the problems. Let, it is maybe a better approach to say, is there a layeredness in the thing? You know? And some of the buildings you show, I think there's an immense, I, I mean, we all look at it and see uh, other layers of, of significance of, uh, of appreciation. And some of these buildings are thin in terms of, well, you, it can be a, a very um, a, a love on, 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 on short, uh, short terms. And then you had it. And then that was that. And uh, how could I ever have been in love with that thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's too thin to really. Huh? Yes. Do you want to continue no, I, this? Uh, yes. Okay, then you have to wait now. Yes. <coughs> yes. No, I would like to preemptively disagree with uh, your first statement because uh, I think it's very, very positive this uh, point of view, uh, which uh, starts from the passion. Mm. more than uh, an academic point of view. And my opinion, which is very attractive of this seminar, is that we don't start with lectures on 60s or 50s or 80s, but we start, every one of us, with our own passions, trying, of course, of rational, uh, rationalizing mm. our passions uh, in, uh, in the last uh, 50 years uh, of architecture. Uh, in that sense, your lecture for me had been uh, modelic, perfect. Uh, uh, has elements, this element of passion of trying to eat buildings more than to uh, <laughs> cut <laughs> them in parts, is what exactly we need. And also, I will add another thing. It seems to me part of our contemporary situation, which uh, the tools of uh, academic analysis are very uh, uninteresting. And more and more, for me at least, uh, it's much more interesting to see what's really happening, which kind of reception of the, of the architecture is uh, produced, much more than an analysis, an abstract or theoretical analysis just in the clouds. Uh, as hermeneutics shows, art or, or the, the cultural products are just in the reception, and that's the, the reception point of view which is the most more important. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Please, well, maybe yeah. one coffee, please. Yeah, I have a very, yeah, very basic question. Um, that is, uh, sorry, um, what is the purpose then to choose canonical building? Um, because uh, um, this question is, uh, I, I think uh, Herman and uh, um, yeah, um chose um, some uh, ten buildings each. But did uh, I feel one thing is did uh, somehow the direction which shows the direction to uh, somehow regionalism or a little bit um, vernacular type of thing? And uh, the other thing is really looks like a very um, high tech type building. And uh, basically, I feel these buildings uh, belong to this kind of area. Um, but you didn't choose any um, postmodern building and uh, uh, other you know, paper architect buildings. I, I mean, if we, we now, you know, if the purpose is to see the, this uh, um, architecture. Um, a movement after World War II, we have to somehow see such kind of postmodern things or uh, some um, buildings of which is proposed, just proposed, but on the paper. Um, or this part, um, the purpose of this uh, master course is to see the future direction of this um, architecture world. I, I wonder this, uh, what is the um, purpose of things. Well, you know, one of the uh, things that is, uh, I mean, the, it's a game, you know, as, as Herman said, it could be seven, it could be nine, it could be almost to the 13, you know. But one of the, one of the things of giving yourself a restriction 
which is also, you know, when I started to do this, and I'm sure Herman felt the same thing, and probably everybody felt the same thing, is that you suddenly think, well, well, I mean, well, what, what would I really say, you know? And then, is it this or it is this, you know? And and by giving yourself a restriction, in a way, you are using a device to compel yourself to make a choice, right? You About mean by, you mean by only built and well, 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 it could be public, but I mean, the, the only built is another bracket, but. Um, you know, but it, as I'm talking about structurally, you know, if you say to yourself, all right, you could do it with anything, I think, but, uh, you know, what do I think, given all of this, what do I think is really important for the culture of the building, or it could be the culture of something else, over a certain period of time, you know, I mean, that's what it comes down to in the end. A limited, uh, uh, the game of a limited choice which you could say is, you know, is a fallacious game, but, but one virtue it has, I think, is that it in a way forces you to make a choice. And, and uh, I think that, that that can be clarifying, you know, in terms of what you yourself think, because you could say that the people who are here, or all of them, yeah, and therefore uh, 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 are you know, though they are not the same, are somehow or other within a certain uh, spectrum, you know. And, and therefore, if, as I think this may be behind your question, actually, if you are saying, well, uh, this is all right, but uh, this isn't really representative of, of what has happened, well, you, you're right, it, it is not representative of what has happened. This is just the beginning. But, no, but I mean, even, if, uh, but even, even sort of, you know, uh, anticipating, you know, because I feel that the question has got to do with, with this kind of anticipation. That, uh, because they, they, you know the list already. And, and what you've just said could be applied more or less to that list, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, you know, you're, you're, you see, because what is behind this question? You, you're asking the question, I'm asking you a question back, is what is behind the question? I think what is behind the question is, uh, well, it's not said, you don't say this, but is this a representative view of the last uh, uh, 46 years, you know, uh, question, you know, is this a representative view? I, I don't think, I don't know what, what, what to say, you know, about, uh, the idea of a representative view, you know, I, I think that in a way, because one enters here this domain of responsibility in a sense, I think, that when, when uh, one plays a game, or, well you can play it of course irresponsibly, but I think that uh, if you try to play it responsibly, I mean making a choice is a kind of responsibility game, you know, and uh, so you stand by your choice, right, I mean, uh, are you justified in some way and you make it. It's a responsibility game. I mean, it's not really a representational, doesn't really have a representational aim in that sense, you see. I think that, I don't know if that's really an answer to the question. But you are, of course, free to bring in another um, yeah. that's the idea of the game. Yeah. <laughs> Five minutes, yeah. But I mean, well, the reason why we... Five more. Yeah, the, more. Yeah, yes. Yeah. But the idea of not having paper buildings, but built buildings, that is a, a, a firm choice that we don't want to... to, to uh, I, in fact, uh, we don't want to discuss that because then we start to discuss something which is about, you know, we could also do something about headache or something about, uh, you know... Uh, but I thought you meant by paper, I mean... Uh, uh, not the build. Of built architecture, which is quote unquote paper. I thought it was what you meant. If we, we don't visit the building, we can see the building only on paper. And uh, but the, uh, many people, I, I think uh, many people didn't see uh, architecture in India or Asia or such kind of place. And uh, and we, I didn't see uh, so many things in Europe yet. Uh, <coughs> it's quite yeah, contradictory now. It's, uh, I, have a, I have a question to two speakers and maybe to the students who have to do also their choice. Uh, I think both uh, Herman and Ken has included buildings they haven't visited yet. You, was this the second one? 
Yeah, the mother of oh, two or three. Yeah. Two or three. And you, you said, you, uh, Stan said, you. Um, I think that. Yes, well, uh, architects and, and, and critics uh, have traveled a lot. Uh, I think more than students uh, still have the opportunity to do so. But in, in what way, uh, and how, far, how important is it to, to experience the building from first sight? And, and not uh, only uh, by reading it uh, in a magazine. I mean, uh, I thought it was you that, that, that once wrote that, that photography is not transparent, that, that it is a filter, and it is... Uh, um, I think it's very important. Talking about myself, I think I, 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 learned, I started to learn about buildings without visiting them, and then came the, the inspiration, how do you say, it's the incitement to, to go there. And I must say, I never was disappointed. It's always what, what I, I saw from the paper and selected as what I should visit. Mm -hmm. The real, no, well, I can't think of a building. I mean, I, 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 I think of, uh, of most buildings as, as, as better in, in reality as what you saw. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know, yeah. but 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 yeah. But, yeah. but just the physical and the tactile, the physical tactile. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't uh, but is that not a, a dangerous argument in um, favour of those who say that you should allow unbuilt architecture or paper architecture? Well, because if, well, if you you can if you can read a, a project the way it, it is it is intended done and, and well intended, you know, uh, there is uh, since San Ilia such a subculture of nonsense in the world, which because, because well, I say nonsense to shock you, uh, I mean in, uh, 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 stating, uh, 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 based on the idea that you can build everything you want. This, you know, somewhere in our age, the idea that everything, every fool can invent, can be built. Well, I must say the Sydney Opera House is on the edge. Mm. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I think, I think uh, 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 you know, uh, the, well, there's now a, a, a large exhibition of Russian constructivist architecture in, 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 in Frankfurt, I think. I would love to go there. But you know, Russian constructivism is, is, is of course, you know, such a such a world of impossibilities. Yeah? Not only impossibilities, but things that even if they could have been constructed, they would have been impossible to, to, to use, etc. Et um, uh, and I think this is this is not the right the right uh, starting point. Of course, there are very uh, serious architects who make projects that can be um, um, realized, you know. But I must say, I, I just, uh, I'm very suspicious seeing the beautiful, transparent projects with models, with light behind and so on, you know. And you get the kick, of course, me too, of whew, this is going to be a thing. But I, I have my doubts whether it, it can be um, uh, realized and, and then uh, have such an impact. And, uh, I mean, do they work in the way uh, uh, they, 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 are they are proposed to work? You know, there are so many things, though, I think, that are in buildings which uh, you can't uh, really uh, get through a photograph. I mean, you know, it's very interesting, like, for instance, I was trying to talk about it, I mean, by accident, really, when I was showing the stuff, because I sensed its absence, you know, is that when you think of the way most things are published, for example, today, anyway, they're often published without certain crucial data, you know. Like, for instance, this, the building I begin with, you know, I've never seen a publication of its site plan relationship. Maybe there's one that exists, I haven't looked hard enough, but I've never seen it, you know. Or if you take Carl's uh, 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 Kimball, I mean, the water in Kimball is crucial to what that building is, the sound of the water also. And the water is often sort of, you, you probably don't see it even, the plan, the, the standard plan doesn't uh, sometimes show it, you know, 
Uh, and I mean, things like this cannot be, you know, they're just not there in, 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 in the photograph, you know. And I think this question of scale, well, I had one interesting experience recently, which is I saw the house of Luis Barragan in Mexico City. And here, even something else, which I think is interesting, which is the architect has released certain photographs of that house and not others. And in my opinion, the house is much, much richer uh, you know, as it is in its totality, not as it is represented, ha as it has been represented also by the architect, you know, that it is richer in its totality as it was, but not as he chose to let it be represented. You know. uh, so, I think that there is all of that good to, to this so discussion. So, it takes a long argument about you know, this question that because the problem is whether you fit the building or not, that it is not so much, uh, let's say, in relation with projects which build are not built, yeah. about that the problem is how in fact they were presented towards you, whether it was possible from the material published to, let's say, to reconstruct yes. the thing mentally. So this is of course... I mean, what we have to do daily, by the way. Yes. That's so what we have to do daily when we try to design a building. So but it's also... This it's could be the argument not to include projects, actually. Yeah, but, but it's also the okay. way that we discuss these things by so showing slides. Yeah. 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 That's great. You know, that in fact, we're not really there. Things, we have to be selective. First of all, we, we can only choose ten, but we have to be selective about the images and about the fact that it's their only images. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not about sounds, they're not about temperature or smells or whatever. So whatever, I mean, whatever we're talking about, we're talking about a reduction and a kind of implicit uh, request to the audience to, in a way, imagine being there. But there is another problem which I think is very important on this. It's the notion of time. Because even when we visit buildings, what kind of experience is that one we have? We never live in the buildings. <laughs> the only building we can talk really in terms of, if you want it physically or tactically, is the one that we, are, we live in. For example, we can talk about this building. Okay? But if we are going there to pick up some pictures or go around and, you know, see... Yeah, I mean, this is a, an experience that has nothing to do with living the buildings. So, this is why, for me, it is the same interest as seeing something published, let's say, because the, the, the issue is, is a different one. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, and also visiting a building, you know. It's, uh, perhaps you can spend uh, hours in looking pictures uh, of a building, you know, and, 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 and trying to understand what happens to you or to the building or whatever. So this is also a different issue. I, I don't think the dichotomy visit versus not visit should be taken like that, you know. It is, in 19th century, of course, architects were forced to visit. Uh, the classical antiquity, okay? Or, but I mean, this is not what happened today. George. But don't you think, George, you underestimate, uh, oh, maybe not mine, but the amount of experience? I mean, it's not only in architectural appreciation, but just in ordinary life. You know, once you have met some certain people, you, maybe you are wrong, but you don't make a, such a list of analysis of is it a good guy to become a friend? Yeah. You have a nose to know these people, okay. After five minutes, you know that you will never be a friend. And with building, for me, it's a bit to say. Of course, it's reductive. And ever, this is a difference between maybe a, someone who wants to be a critic, who became critics, and someone who is part of the game. With Maybe we are wrong with our choice. So this is maybe when Mr. Wong talk with uh, this problem of representation, how to, to make critics, how to present building. You know, Paul Valéry said once, you know, the role of critic is not to explain what is good or bad, and worse, what you should have done, which is very often, like, but what someone has tried to do, maybe. Oh, yeah. And this oh, yeah. is to explain to be the, the contact between one artist or an architect and some other ones. To look, you should and what I like very much in both of your uh, slides or your presentation is yeah, one point of view, clearly, it's not a problem of theory and practice or patience or not, because I am sure there are many, much patience in uh, Kenneth Frampton, as much patience in the way of looking at things, and they are in your 
own fear and own manner. Herman, but it's maybe one is really doing things, so has to do things, and one has to write. And maybe there is some differences. Maybe, maybe I'm not so <coughs> sure. And, but it's a, it's a problem. Just to what I I, I found very interesting in, in kind of Frampton's talk is, you know, this problem of canonical or well this word, but there is Hans Georg Gadamer, uh, this uh, German philosopher. He said there are uh, actually he defined he, he, he definit, He said there is no work of art who are not an inaugura uh, inauguration, inaugur which doesn't we don't who don't. I inaugurate, inaugurate a new way. As a, you know, there are many, many followers, but there are some work, what we call art, who are really work of art, the one who make the world broader. So, like I said, after a real artist, the world is broad. It's clear. After, for example, Richard Long. In my point of view, the world is broader. That means that we can see or feel, or really the world is also the world of mind. So, and after this problem of architecture of paper, on the, we, when we see Le Corbusier, he's maybe the, the biggest paper architect in the world. He built the tenth or the, the hundred of what he drew. But we are, there is no cut between, that was you were saying, Herman. He's not drawing anything. He's making plan. It's clear when he, when he, he wrote about what he's doing with his pencil. But maybe a lot of what you have said in, in about Hallen is included in early drawings. Yes. Le, for example, Rob Brun or Cap Martin. He never yes. built uh, Cap Martin, but this kind of paper architecture is really canonical in your point. So it's very interesting to, to have this uh, week to talk about this. I think it's a problem for the critics of precision. But, but the same, we talk a lot with Herman about this artist, poetry, let's say, poesy, the problem de precision. And also critics. Because when you write something about uh, uh, visual versus tactile, and you talk about Senecello, Alto's uh, Civic Center, I never read something so precise about the floor, about the, the tide, about the wood, about the light. And this is all what uh, Alvar Alto for me is made, uh, architecture is made of. So, and how many critics now, if you find it's impossible about materials, I'm still, <laughs> impossible to find a good plan of the uh, 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 University, not even in Alvar Alto's uh, uh, publication, there is no the one ground for plan. In the complete work, it is written competition plan, but not the, the, the realized one. So this shows how we are in false abstraction, because the difference between Herman and, and Kenneth Frampton, or critics and architects, is not theory and practice. This is really, for me, childish. I mean. Uh, there is no practical work. It's just like saying that Mozart is practical and a critic is theoretical about Mozart, no? to, to escape from Hermann. But any good conversation or any one who had a talk with Hermann know how, how it's really practical in a way. <laughs> it's childish. It's more complicated. You already have your hands. I don't know your name. Gustav Metzger. Gustav Metzger, yes. I'd like to uh, concentrate on the, the essential tasks facing us all as given by the organizers, namely the question of criteria. And perhaps I always think it's good to refer to documents. So I, I just quickly read what is said on this basic document about the problem. It goes without saying that it is not the actual selected buildings, but most of all the criteria used to make a selection, which forms the departure for discussion during the seminar. And I fully agree, it was emphasized by you this morning. And it comes up again in this other document here, uh, similarly of importance. The criterion argumentation they use or we use 
to make this choice is the subject of the public evening lectures and the morning seminars. Now, the second line of this stock document I find uh, useful as, an, as a starting point for this discussion. It says here, during this master class we will discuss quality in architectural production, or in other words, what makes a building a good work of architecture. Now I think it would be very helpful if we look at this and leave out the last two words in, and say, what makes a building a good work? And here I come back to the origin of modern architecture, which of course, uh, uh, as we, if you read Pevsner and so much else, or you, uh, is the 19th century, particularly the second half of the 19th century. People, Ruskin, Morris, Arts and Crafts. They would have, I think, agreed with this formulation. What makes a building a good work? rather than what makes a build, building a good work of architecture, because the good work for them was the totality of the work, and not merely the architecture, that is to say, not the visuals. And the tragedy of our times, the stupidity of postmodernism, that they've turned their principle, which is the origin of our work, completely upside down and said, let us look at the exterior and judge the exterior. Let us look at what it looks like. Let us look at architecture rather than look at the work. And let us not ever pose, let us not ever dare to pose the question which they pose, which is, is the work a good work, good for society, good for the past, good for the future? These questions have been eliminated ruthlessly by postmodernism. And that is the subject of my uh, entrance to this discussion if you'll permit me to go on. Uh, and some of what I have to say may, may start you and will probably offend you, but if we now turn to the other document given to us by uh, Kenneth Frampton, his second paragraph, which I find extremely fascinating, uh, by the way, may I say a lot of it, what I heard and seen today is very fascinating, but of course, in this discussion, one mustn't go into it. But this second paragraph, the disruption of traditional society, brought about by the ever-escalating onslaught of techno-scientific modernization and instrumentality has thrown the whole idea of canon into crisis. Other than achieving the maximum economic return for minimum investment, homo economical, economical. economical has hardly any other notion of what is canon. Now I think he poses the problem which they posed. What, is, uh, what are the economic forces behind art and, and architecture? And here I will come up with my most starting point. Unless the Belage Institute injects political criteria, for example, political discourse as an integral part of its functioning, it will have no contribution to make. I'm quite happy to discuss it. That's my point of view. The cutting edge of modern art is subversive. We've heard of Picasso, Stravinsky. That is the essence of their art of their intellect, of their contribution to modern art. And we know that modern art has strongly influenced the development of modern architecture. End of ideology is today the key word. Now, ideology, in my term, is a set of ideas underpinned by a set of political ideas and goals, being used for the attainment of these goals. Now, we have, we, the end of ideology is simultaneously reveals the bankruptcy of our system. And that is the distortion we have. There is a veil thrown over. Hurrah, because the end of ideology, i.e. communism and so on, has disappeared from the world. Now we can blossom. We can blossom into the ozone layer. Capitalism has destroyed the world more than communism because simply gets bigger, America is the biggest destroyer of, of the environment, that even the Americans say that. Uh, I, now, in reference to the point of the sea domain, now here com I come to... to Can you come to the point where you think whether, uh, you know, whether, I mean, the argument is quite clear, I think, although, uh, Yeah. Well, you were going to say the seagull. You were going to 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to, to a crucial point in my argumentation. You referred, you, you posed the question, what is a good seed loom? What are good seed looms? Referring to Harlem, but of course you were thinking of so many other canonical seed looms, yeah, that you have, you have discussed. Now, there, you see, we come to the central point of what I'm trying to introduce in this particular week. What are good seed looms? We saw what are good seed looming, but what goes into good seed looming? Motor cars, refrigerators, all kinds of technical equipment. Now, at that time that these seed looming were praised for being very progressive, all the seed looming in the 20th century, we did not know what refrigerators do to the ozone layer. But we do know now. In other words, when we analyze a good seed room, we are forced, and this is why I'm saying, unless political discourse comes into this institute, it is finished. It has no future. It will only be concerned with beauty, with traditional, with canons, what you like. It will make no conclusion to society, to the future of the world, which I think is the problem that agitates young people to some extent. So a good seed room, if we don't say, oh, but listen, there is refrigerators, and they said, this was the last thing, great. Only in the last five years are architects being to think, well, we better perhaps do something about it. So this is the essence, I think, of this is the challenge facing all, all of us, not just here. Now, very, very briefly, you said Germans felt <coughs> apocalypse more strongly. Well, let me inject a, a personal note, because otherwise I would be less understood. I am German in the sense that my parents are Polish Orthodox Jews, but we children were brought up in Nuremberg, also a significant architectural and historical town. So in other words, I lived through Speer. I saw Speer when I was six or five years old, and every year saw uh, the Nazi culture becoming more and more powerful till I was thrown out, and my parents were deported and finally killed. And so don't be surprised if I, uh, a German, escaped you, have am particularly apocalyptic and particularly concerned with, with political uh, matters relating to culture in, in the wider sense, because that's what is my personal development. I'm very glad you consistently had the light motif of automobiles, because I am obsessed with automobiles. I'm even making an enormous sculpture for project for the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro with 120 motor cars, which will inject their own zone killing material into... Yes, I'm just finishing. I'm just, well, excuse me, I don't think you're being fair to me. You say you come to the point. Look, if you're listening to me, you will realize I'm coming to the point all the time. So please don't exert authoritative measures to try and disrupt my subversive statement, because I feel that's coming from you. So far, you haven't interrupted anybody. Oh. You are just interrupting me, so I think you're revealing your own resentment at the ideas I'm expressing. We can talk about that, maybe private. Now, that summing up one, summing it up in one, uh, one sentence I have here, the last one in fact, questioning the material. You see, we talk about the beauty of the bricks. We talk about the aesthetics today. We heard it again and again. I am saying. We have to question the material architecture, not just the exterior, the interior, the refrigerators, the technical equipment, which we know now is destructive again and again. Uh, we say we don't like the motor cars coming in that way or that way. We should say we don't like the motor cars, period. What can we do as individuals, and particularly as architects? Because if you think architects have no power, well, we can talk about it. I think architects have great power and they don't use it, they should use it, in terms of planning, etc. <coughs> Only one other point, one other point which is, I think, relevant here. I took part for three months in the Mansion House Square Inquiry, which must have been one of the most fascinating architectural experiences of Prince when, uh, when the plans of Mies van der Rohe for the redevelopment of the prototype were discussed for three months, and I attended every day. I'm neither an architect nor a critic, but I was so fascinated, and I was prepared to a book on it. So I learned a great deal about Seagram, and you'd be surprised to what extent it was criticized. There were days after day after day when expert architects, expert art historians, etc., were criticizing it in the minutest detail. So I think that's something we should also consider, that the greatest architects of our time are subject and should be subject to detailed criticism attack 
of the kind for example they had in London in the spring of 1984. And I wrote it all down. And some of these documents exist, and they're worth studying in detail. Yeah, I, I think that I agree with a lot of things you say. Um, but uh, architects do and don't have power. And uh, they're not really, as opposed to the past, they were essential to power. They have long, for long, been not essential to power. And, and uh, so they, they don't have the uh, leverage on power that they had, I don't think. Even then, when, when they did have it, because more power is power, I think. And, uh, Architects don't have power in that sense. I, I disagree with that. Sure. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Francis, you still want to? Well, those things have already been spoken of. But perhaps as the issue of ideology is raised, uh, perhaps it's indeed not. Uh, totally superfluous to think about that uh, even in the notion of canon somewhere is hidden ideology. You, you didn't make it explicit. Uh, and that, is it possible to uh, yes, I say that the, the notion of ideology is even hidden in the, in the notion of canon. Uh, when I compare uh, your two uh, presentations of Herman and uh, Kenneth Frampton. Uh, I, I see indeed uh, a difference. Uh, Herman has his own canon, and that means that, as he said, he likes what 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 he can eat, what he what he can identify with as an architect, as a designer. And indeed, when we saw buildings, uh, I. I think of the Greek building, which could have been designed by Herman, which I, I didn't know, but he, he is discovering things. Which building? The Greek one, the school. By the school. Um, so, and he, he reacts in a very emotional way. Uh, that's what I like. And that's his frame of reference, in a way. But whereas you uh, are acting really as an historian who wants, you have tried to give us a lot of different and even opposed directions in uh, the post-war architecture. So we began with uh, the station, but you connected it rightly with uh, Rossi and with Terragni and with Piacentini even before. So it's all, all world. Uh, you can like it or, or not. Uh, some people don't like it at all. Uh, but uh, in any way, it's totally opposed to your uh, second example of Siedlungshallen, which is a prototype of, uh, let me say, uh, uh, democratic uh, housing uh, with an anarchist uh, um, um, uh, cooperative uh, basis. Uh, which is totally opposed to your first example. So there, the ideology indeed comes in. And my question is, you, how can you consider those two examples as canonical? It's, of course, I understand your uh, definition, a new paradigm, paradigm with respect to generic social cultural condition. But that is very neutral, of course. It can go in many directions. But after all, we all as a human being, beings, I think we, we make choices. And somewhere we say, yes, that we like, even, like you say, as a friend, uh, as a sympathy, that we like, and that really we don't like. So I think it's difficult to, to have those two examples as, as, as canons. The same thing, I think, uh, after all, with the Seagram building, which is very significant for New York for that particular place and making a square and so on. But it is 
incompatible as a concept with central behavior, I think, which I like much more. So, yeah, I get that. Well, I have two. Uh, uh, well, I think I have made really only one response, which is that uh, I, I see the argument, but I think that uh, in some ways it's also com made complex by the fact that uh, um, the question of residential fabric. Uh, uh, on the one hand, and uh, uh, civic institution on the other, and uh, the problem of maintaining the idea of institution. And so in that sense, of course, uh, and this may be an uh, ideological difference between us, you know, but uh, I think that uh, architecture has been about institution. and. Uh, and that these institutions, i.e. The, the, the bourgeois tradition of institution and of civic institution, of what uh, Hannah Arendt calls space of public appearance, I think is extremely important to any kind of political discourse. And when you lose this space of public appearance, you lose uh, this realm for, the, for this discourse. So, uh, although I, I can see that the monumentality of of uh, the Italian, uh, well, for argument's sake, the Italian rationalist movement uh, through the period of the 30s, even in its extension to the 60s, uh, has, uh, uh, you know, that syntactically you can say that there are things there which, uh, in some kind of uh, uh, reduced sense, and maybe correct sense, are similar to uh, let us say uh, the institutions of the of the uh, Nazi Nazi state, for example, or <coughs> the whole business of the state, you know, which, uh, as represented through architecture, uh, has a complex history and and uh, and disturbing history for some people, you know, because there is this direct reading of it as as being, by definition. Uh, because it is the state oppressive. You know. But uh, the, we live in a time in which, I think, for architecture, but also for society, the invisible power, in other words, the disappearance of the state, you know, uh, but the presence of power nonetheless, even though the state is, is trying to disappear, is, in fact, more insidious, insidious power than ever, in fact, you know, but not expressed to us. Not, you know, not needing architecture for the exercise of its power, in fact. You know. Uh, you know, I mean, there's so many examples of this. I mean, uh, I think, you know, present also in the field, reflected in architecture. You know. I mean, we were talking the other day about what I think is, at the moment, a, a Dutch policy about law courts, which should not be, according to recent policy, have any representational presence and should really be just ordinary office buildings. You know. I mean, this, I think, is, is what I mean by this invisible, you know, in the name of not to alarm and not to intimidate people with, you know, the presence of the law. I mean, we'll just make an ordinary office building. But this, I think, is, is, is the sinister uh, uh, disappearance of the, of the uh, race publica, you know. Uh, hmm? yeah. And so I think this, there are two issues here. I think one is, I agree with you, of course, that uh, my view is more, if you like, detached and, and, uh, uh, by, and, and therefore also, of course, related to what I do with my life, <laughs> but uh, how I misspend my life. But, uh, 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 but, the, but I think at the same time, you know, the, the, the built fabric is one thing and the uh, civic institution is another thing. And that, Exactly, one has to recognize that they have a different history, anyway, in, in, we, in Western yes, uh, European culture. Yes, but you can say that in the Italian tradition, these monumental civic buildings were hardly considered in relation to the fabric. 
they were very autonomous. And Rossi is... This is a typical non-European, if I might be a bit polemical view. And also the idea, I'm sorry to say that, but the idea also to associate politics so mechanically with architecture for me is the most... This is really kind of, this is a political issue actually. Mm. No, I, I don't have, I, I will talk tomorrow that tomorrow when I will show Rossi's yes. modern cemetery, which I choose it provocatively to open up this kind of discussion. Mm. Okay. Then I think we, I propose to stop this discussion because then we can come on Wednesday.